We welcome you to today's American Zionist Movement National Zionism Conference. Our theme is Zionism Forward, Leadership, Vision, and Reality. We've drawn this theme together from Theodore Herzl, because in 1897 it was Theodore Herzl who called together a disparate Jewish people from all over Europe, and they gathered in Basel for the first World Zionist Congress. And ever since that time, we have, in a sense, been applauding, been respecting, been appreciating the leadership of Theodore Herzl, the vision of Theodore Herzl. And today we celebrate the reality as envisioned by Theodore Herzl through the modern state of Israel. The American Zionist movement consists of 35 national Jewish Zionist organizations from across the spectrum of Jewish life, representing religious movements, religious streams, representing different synagogues, representing different organizations. Some are engaged in health care. Some are engaged in service. Some are engaged in providing assistance to lone soldiers. Some are engaged in chazbara, in exchange of ideas, all about Israel, Zionism, and the Jewish people. But the seminal underlying ideas come from Theodore Herzl. His leadership, his vision, and the reality that he foresaw more than 120 years ago. Today we're going to be joined by speakers, dignitaries, presenters, friends, even some foes. You won't like everything that you hear, but within the American Zionist movement, we have a policy. It's called respectful dialogue. We all sit together around the same round tables. We all sit together to exchange ideas and we do so with respect for one another, even when we disagree, because it is the unity of the Jewish people that is more important than almost anything. That we find a way to come together over issues of the day, over challenges that we face every day, join together to battle against the spate of hate the anti-Semitism that we are seeing rampant around the world. That anti-Semitism is not new. It is age old. And there are people like Hitler and the, and the Third Reich, the Nazi regime, who were determined to annihilate all of the Jewish people. But we are here. And we are here to celebrate the future of Zionism and do so within the keeping of our theme, Zionism Forward. We've done programs over the last uh, four years that includes uh, working with uh, I-24 News, spotlighting various organizations of the American Zionist movement. We've worked together with the World Zionist Organization. We've worked together with the Center to Combat Anti-Semitism and Anti-Zionism. We've worked together at the United Nations to try to educate, to try to expose, to try to inform, and to try to impact the thinking and the attitudes at the United Nations that are so rampantly anti-Israel, anti-Zionist, and indeed are too often indeed anti-Semitic. Because when you single out Israel, you are indeed singling out one nation and one people. We are an old people. We don't just come to this stage willy-nilly. We're an ancient people with roots in our ancient homeland to which we have returned. In the spirit of Zionism, let us work together across all of our organizations. Let us work together 
to see to it that we embrace our young people. We educate them Jewishly. We give them a commitment to their Jewish identity. We give them the opportunity to be able to have the knowledge necessary to stand up for what is right. That means in their college campuses, in their international relations courses, they need to understand the richness of our Jewish history. They need to understand the right of Israel to exist as a nation state in the family of nations and yes, indeed, as the nation state of the Jewish people. They need the ability to do so with pride and with determination and they need the ability to do so based upon knowledge and not based upon fiction. They are told that Israel is an apartheid, racist, criminal state. You know that's not the case. I know that's not the case. Israel knows that's not the case. But in the war of public opinion against Israel, it's all too easy for the haters and the deniers to castigate Israel, single her out, and accuse Israel of dastardly things. Let us together, as Zionists, from around the world, from around the United States, from around our various synagogues and organizations, let us come together in the spirit of moving Zionism forward, and let us do so in the spirit of Theodore Herzl, recognizing his leadership, honoring his vision, respecting and appreciating the reality that we have accomplished together in our time. Thank you for joining us today. Indeed, I'm now pleased and honored to introduce Dr. Francine Stein, the chair of the AZM National Board. Francine? Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Francine Stein. I am chair of the AZM National Board. And I'm so pleased to welcome you to our program today. It uh, should be a very exciting and interesting one filled with uh, much to, to learn about Zionism. Um, I have learned that Zionism comes in many forms. When I was uh, a young girl, my parents took me to Israel and that was my first exposure. Um, I since went to uh, Young Judea and Camp Tel Yehuda and my Zionism really blossomed there. And I think, you know, I was limited in my understanding of Zionism just by my own experiences. But having uh, been part of the AZM as well as the Jewish Agency for Israel and the World Zionist Organization, I have learned that Zionism takes many shapes and forms and we're all able to come together here at the AZM to share our love of Israel and do our work together. Uh, there are people in the AZM from the po political left, political right, somewhere in the middle. Uh, there's a whole spectrum of uh, people. There are uh, different, different forms of uh, religious observance, right, left, not observant. Uh, but again, what ties us all together is our love of Israel and our Zionism. And I think it's very important to understand Understand that there's passion from everyone, no matter what side you are on and no matter what form your Zionism takes. And I think that we can still uh, use the AZM and be part of the AZM to air our views and accept our differences and share our love of Israel together. Hopefully we can all be together in person soon rather than the Zoom format that we've been using for over a year. And I look forward to seeing many of you in person in the coming years or coming months rather. And um, let's keep celebrating Zionism. Thank you. Francine, thank you very much for your inspiring words and for the leadership that you have provided. Uh, to the American Zionist Movement as the chair of the AZM National Board. Uh, together we have uh, worked hard with all of the organizations to address each of their needs and their challenges and their questions and their ideas and to embrace those ideas. 
Now we're pleased to share with you messages we've received from uh, Israel government officials uh, and uh, Israeli diplomats. Uh, Minister Omer Yankalevich, the Israeli Minister of Diaspora Affairs. Ambassador Gilad Erdan, Israel's permanent representative to the United Nations and Israel's ambassador to the United States of America. And Israel Nitzan, the Consul General of Israel in New York. Shalom lekulam. It is my privilege to join all of you as a convener of 35 member organizations. The American Zionist movement continues to be a platform for one of the most diverse conversations regarding the relationship between Israel and world Jewry today. When the American Zionist movement was founded over a century ago, it was the Zionist dream which gave American Jews a sense of hope and identity. Today, we live in a world where we have two vibrant centers of Jewish life, in Israel and North America. This creates the historic opportunity for each side to draw mutual strength and inspiration from the other, but in addition, from within our own communities and the greater Jewish people. This demonstrates that, driven by our common destiny, we can and must work towards a stronger and more unified future. AZM models this work by bringing together American Jewish voices and empowering its members to vote organize and speak. We at the Ministry of Diaspora Affairs are your partners in this mission. During my time in office, we have focused on building a formal consultation process between the Government of Israel and World Jewry. This initiative is built around the simply truth that the Jewish world deserves a voice in the Jewish state. As a part of this process, we hosted round tables with the Jewish communities around the world. The AZM and the movements within its network have been key partners in this process. I want to thank all, all those who have shared their experience with us. We have taken in your insights and are committed to moving forward this process, regardless of who sits in the government. Together, we are building a more mutual and open Jewish public square, which fosters greater dialogue, understanding, and positive action. Thank you, Mr. Herbert Block, for the invitation to participate and your continued leadership and vision. I look forward to the opportunity to soon meet all of you, whether here in Jerusalem or the U.S. Toda Thank you very much. Shalom, everyone. And thank you, Richard, for that warm introduction. And thank you as well to Francine, Herbert, and Alicia for your tireless efforts in strengthening the American Zionist community. It is a pleasure to address AZM. Though we are virtual today, I look forward to addressing and meeting you all in person soon. A few weeks ago, I had the privilege of introducing myself to your organization. As someone who has dedicated his life to Zionism in service of the world's only Jewish state, I feel a special kinship with the Zionist movement in America. It is amazing to me that in the United States, there are 33 separate Zionist organizations, each representing one part of the incredibly diverse mosaic of this country's Jewish community. As Israel's ambassador to the United States, one of my top priorities is to build ties between Israelis and all of the different communities in the United States. 
This is the foundation of the U.S.-Israel alliance, and I see members of all Jewish communities as my brothers and sisters. It is important that diaspora Jewry feels closely connected with Israel. This connection is integral to my other top priority of maintaining and strengthening America's bipartisan support for Israel. Almost every day I speak with members of Congress from both sides of the aisle and with, of course, administration officials. We discuss exciting ideas for expanding the already extensive cooperation between our countries. I realize that my conversations with the American officials are strengthened by the American Zionist community's great support for Israel. This is also true in the United Nations, where AZM has played an important role in advancing Israel's standing. Through diplomatic delegations, you have brought over 100 ambassadors from 66 countries to Poland and Israel. These trips have done so much good for the Jewish people and the Jewish state. Today, I wish you all the best on your special event. This year's theme of Zionism Forward is more appropriate than ever as Israel forges new ties of peace throughout the region and leads the world out of the COVID pandemic. Together, we will ensure that Israel continues to be a beacon of hope and light for the world. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Shalom. It is my pleasure to join all of you here today as we celebrate the achievements of the American Zionist movement and its leadership in communities near and far. As a representative of the State of Israel, I'm proud to acknowledge AZM's activities in strengthening the connection between Israel and the Jewish communities throughout the diaspora. These bonds and steadfast support help in the continuance of our vital mission the essence of Zionism, the return of the Jewish people to our homeland, the establishment of the state of Israel as a beacon of light, just like Israel has shown throughout the world. Having a true connection to our Jewish values and traditions and understanding the importance of our Jewish homeland is vital today more than ever before. We all know that we are living during times of rapid change and numerous challenges. AZM and its 35 diverse national Jewish Zionist organizations throughout the United States understand that the one thing that can keep us strong is our common heritage and the pride we share in being Zionists. While the Jewish community encompasses a broad spectrum of ideology, politically and religiously, the AZM provide an opportunity to discuss our differences and hopefully learn that our commonality overcomes these differences. No matter where we are in the world or how we, are, how we practice our Judaism, we must remember where we all started and what we seek in our future. The Zionist movement has faced many challenges since Herzl first convened the Zionist Congress in Basel over 120 years ago. As long as we can continue our conversation, acknowledging our basic common beliefs and shared commitment to Herzl's vision and to the state of Israel, I know our community will grow stronger and Israel will reap further rewards. I wish all of you much success. Thank you. We're so pleased to welcome back to, to the American Zionist Movement, Professor Gil Troy. Professor Troy is at McGill University. He's an author and historian. His acclaimed book on the Zionist ideas uh, is one worth reading. Please uh, listen to uh, Professor Gil Troy sharing his keynote remarks today on Zionism. Hi, this is Gil Troy with greetings to the American Zionist Movement, my good friends from Jerusalem. 20 years ago, just as Arafat's war against Israel, against the Jewish people, against civility was starting, 
Jews in Montreal, where I lived, were in despair. I'm sorry to say that many of my American Jewish friends were blaming Israel for Arafat's turn from negotiation back toward terrorism. And so, to celebrate Yom Atzmut, Israel Independence Day, I wrote an 800-word essay that changed my life. Coming out from behind my hiding place as Gil Troy, a neutral sounding name, Professor Gil Troy, American historian, I stood tall and proud in the Montreal Gazette and said, I am a Zionist, and said again and again why I was so proud, why we are all so lucky to be living in a world where we have a Jewish state, both as Jews and as non-Jews. And since then, I've been trying to build a platform of what I call identity Zionism. And American Zionist movement is basically about identity Zionism because you obviously have differences, left, right, more religious, less religious, but we also have similarities. We have a common sense of identity, a common sense of peoplehood, a common love for the land of Israel, common love for the Jewish people. And so with that, I send very warm greetings and hope that you'll enjoy this video. Tragically, too many Jews today avoid the Z word as extremists left and right demonize Zionism. But why let our enemies define us? We are not just anti-anti-Semites or anti-anti-Zionists. Jews should reaffirm their faith in Zionism. The world should appreciate this gutsy, visionary movement which rescued a shattered people by reuniting a scattered people. No country is perfect, no movement pure, no state ideal. But today, Zionism remains legitimate, inspiring, and relevant. Zionism offers an identity anchor in a world of dizzying choices and a roadmap toward national renewal and personal meaning. Zionism believes that one, Judaism isn't just a religion. Jews are a people. Two, that Jews have ties to a particular homeland. And three, that Jews have the rights to establish a state on that homeland. A century ago, Zionism revived pride in the label Jew. Today, Jews must revive pride in the label Zionist. I am a Zionist. I am a Zionist because I celebrate Israel's existence. Even when I criticize particular government policies, I do not delegitimize the state itself. I am a Zionist because I wake up every day looking forward to working together to work through our long society-improving to-do list, starting with Israel's unfulfilled promises of full equality to Arabs, Ethiopians, Mizrahim, the poor. But I also go to sleep every night looking backwards, appreciating our progress, how much better off we are in 2021 than we were in 2001 or 1981, let alone 1967 or any year before 1948. I am a Zionist because I am a Jew. Without recognizing Judaism's national component, I cannot explain its unique character. Judaism is a world religion bound to one homeland, shaping a people whose holidays ritualize religious concepts, relive historic events, and revolve around Israel's agricultural calendar. Only in Israel can a Jew fully live in Jewish space and by Jewish time. I am a Zionist because I share the past, present, and future of my people, the Jewish people. I am a Zionist because I know my history. For 1900 years, enduring repeated persecutions, the wandering Jews never forgot their biblical homeland. Wherever we prayed, we turned toward Jerusalem, Zion, our forever home. I am a Zionist because Europe's promise in the 1800s became a double-edged sword, only offering Jews acceptance if they assimilated, yet never fully respecting those who did assimilate. I am a Zionist because just as India or Japan are modern states built on ancient civilizations, Israel's establishment in 1948 updated our ancient language, Hebrew, created cutting-edge cities, and retrofitted the Jews' 3,000-year-old capital, Jerusalem. I am a Zionist because this democratic Jewish state returned Jews to history as activists, not victims, with all the responsibilities and dilemmas power provides. I am a Zionist because Israel worked. It welcomed Jews home after millennia of bruising homelessness, Holocaust survivors and refugees from Arab lands, Ethiopians and Russians, Jews who fled in fear and those who came by choice. I am a Zionist because I live in the real world of nation states. Zionism is no more or less tribal than any other Western nationalism, be it American, British, Canadian, or Dutch. I am a Zionist because a country without a vision is like a person without a soul. Fusing liberalism with nationalism 
produced free, prosperous, always improving democracies, including Israel, despite terrifying attacks, often testing its egalitarian values and basic freedoms. I am a Zionist because I am an idealist. Just as a century ago, imagining an independent democratic Jewish state was an impossible dream, yet worth fighting for, so too today, imagining a thriving, independent, democratic Jewish state living in peace with all its neighbors appears to be an impossible dream, yet worth seeking. I am a Zionist because I am a romantic. The Jews rebuilding their homeland, reclaiming the desert, renewing themselves was our grandparents' great adventure. The story of the Jews maintaining their homeland, reconciling with the Arab world, renewing themselves, and serving as a light to others, a model nation state could be ours. Yes. It sometimes sounds far-fetched, but as Theodor Herzl, the father of modern Zionism, said in an idle boast that has become a cliché, if you will it, it is no dream. So I am a Zionist because there is still work to be done, and I'm ready. We're ready to do it. Uh, as part of our theme of Zionism Forward, uh, leadership, vision, and reality, uh, let's focus on leadership. And one place to start is with uh, the members of the United States Congress who have paid tribute to the American Zionist movement at various of our events. I recall that we did a wonderful event, a challenging event that was very bipartisan and held up on Capitol Hill at uh, the congressional offices. Today we have messages uh, from a number of members of Congress, and I stress on a bipartisan basis. We welcome each of you and thank you for paying tribute to the important work of the American Zionist movement. I'm Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz, and I represent Florida's 23rd Congressional District. As the first Jewish woman elected to represent Florida in the U.S. House of Representatives, I bring my Judaism to work with me every day. It's been a privilege to stand up for some of the most pressing issues in our community, whether that's supporting the needs of our aging residents and Holocaust survivors, ensuring our kids are safe in our schools, enhancing security measures at our community centers and our places of worship, or working to maintain our nation's unbreakable bond with the State of Israel, our most true and dependable Middle East ally. As some of you may know, I am a senior member of the House Appropriations Committee which is the vital spending panel that provides most of our assistance to Israel. Support for Israel means an ironclad commitment to Israel's security, including maintaining its qualitative military edge in defense against emerging threats. Support for Israel also means standing up against disproportionate one-sided criticism and delegitimization, whether it's taking place in an international institution or on a college campus, whether it's a biased resolution or a BDS campaign. Regarding these vital issues, I will continue to use my voice and my vote in Washington. One issue that I have been quite vocal about these past few months is the scourge of anti-Semitism that plagues our nation. Far too many of us must confront this hatred far too often. As a human being, but also as a proud Jew, my values compel me to speak out against identity-based hate, especially anti-Semitism. That's one of the reasons I am a founding member of the newly established Interparliamentary Task Force to Combat Online Anti-Semitism. We must have an international strategy and truly committed global allies to take on online anti-Semitism. Amid this global pandemic, when more people are online, the urgency is even greater. We must demand real global accountability and strong social media safeguards. Finally, I would be remiss if I did not wish everyone a happy Jewish American Heritage Month which is celebrated nationally each May. When I sponsored the legislation creating Jewish American Heritage Month in 2005, our goal was to honor and share the important contributions that American Jews have made to our nation and highlight the resiliency of our people. And I think we can all agree that from the pandemic to last summer's civil rights demonstrations and through the election and its aftermath, this past year has put our resiliency to the test. Here in Washington, Dal Yemhoff is now the first Jewish second gentleman and the first Jew second gentleman ever. Senator John Ossoff's victory marks the first time Georgia has sent a Jew to the Senate and the first time a Southern state has elected a Jewish senator in over four decades. And across the globe, Jewish doctors, nurses, scientists, and organizations led the charge to address the COVID-19 pandemic. 
I'm hopeful that thanks to their diligent work and that of so many others, this may be the last time we celebrate Jewish American Heritage Month virtually. Thank you for inviting me to join you, and thank you to the AZM and its members for all you do to defend the state of Israel and strengthen our Jewish community. Hi, this is Congressman Lee Zeldin. Israel remains America's staunchest ally, friend, and partner. During the four years of the Trump administration, the United States passed and signed into law the Taylor Force Act, withdrew from the Iran nuclear deal, moved our embassy in Israel to Jerusalem, recognized Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights, combated anti-Semitism and anti-Israel hate, and signed the historic Abraham Accords. I'm troubled by the Biden administration's eagerness to rejoin the Iran deal and lift sanctions on the regime without addressing the end of the arms embargo, the sunset clauses, flaws with the prior verification agreement and Iran's non-nuclear bad activities. In Congress, I continue to champion efforts to crack down on anti-Semitism, support Holocaust education, fight anti-Israel hate, and allow state and local governments to divest public funds from entities that support the BDS movement. Thank you for allowing me to join you virtually today and for all the work you do on behalf of the American Jewish community. Hello, I'm Congresswoman Kathy Manning, and I represent North Carolina's 6th Congressional District. I'm pleased to join you today. In Congress, I'm proud to serve on the Foreign Affairs Committee and to be serving as the Vice Chair of the Middle East, North Africa, and Global Terrorism Subcommittee. In this role, I'm a vocal advocate for a strong U.S.-Israel relationship. Prior to being elected to Congress, I was the first woman to chair the board of the Jewish Federations of North America. In this role, I visited Israel dozens of times and work with many of you to strengthen the relationship that our two great nations share. Last week, we celebrated Yom Hatzma'ut, and in my remarks on the House floor, I highlighted some of the many innovations that Israel has contributed to the world since its founding. Despite being one of the only countries in the Middle East with no oil, Israel has developed a thriving economy. Known as the startup nation, it has a vibrant high-tech sector, extraordinary R&D capabilities, and medical breakthroughs that have benefited the world. Israel has literally made the desert bloom with innovative irrigation methods, agricultural techniques, and desalinization processes that have allowed this desert nation to provide top quality fruits and vegetables to the world. Israel also remains the only democracy in the Middle East and our strongest and most reliable ally in the region. I share in the deep pride felt for what Israel has accomplished since her founding, and I'm committed to protecting her peace and security. I look forward to working with each of you to build on our progress, to continue fighting for a strong U.S.-Israel relationship, and to eradicating anti-Semitism worldwide. Best wishes on a successful gathering. Hello, everybody. This is Robert Adderholt, Congressman from Alabama's 4th Congressional District. Thank you all for inviting me to speak to you for a few minutes today. The American Zionist Movement is a great organization with an important mission, and it is crucial that the United States continue to support this movement by promoting and defending Israel. As you know, there have been some major accomplishments recently. Chief among them is the relocation of the United States Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, a move that President Trump championed. But we all know there's still more to be done. And I look forward to working with my colleagues here in Washington to protect and defend Israel in any way we can. So thank you, may God bless Israel, and may God bless the United States of America. Hello, I'm Congressman Brad Schneider, and I am a proud member of the American Zionist Movement. I'm also a beneficiary of the WZO, having attended the Wujis Institute in Arad almost 40 years ago. It is my great honor to extend greetings. Your gathering, albeit virtual, is at a time of what I believe is great historic importance for Israel, for Zionism, and for the American Jewish community. We just celebrated Yom Hatzma'ut, recognizing the birth of the Jewish state 73 years ago. As you all well know, within 11 minutes of the Declaration of Statehood, 
the United States became the first country to formally recognize Israel. Since then, our two countries have built a critical, unbreakable bond rooted in our shared values, common interests, and strategic imperatives. As the region's only democracy, Israel is our best ally in the Middle East and one of our most important allies in the entire world. Israel's existence as a Jewish, democratic, secure state is vital to the Jewish community around the world and to the peace of the entire Middle East. Israel has, of course, played a formative role in my own life. I'm old enough to have memories of the Sixth Day and Yom Kippur Wars, but I also well remember the U.S. role in achieving peace agreements with Egypt and Jordan, and just last year had the privilege to, to witness the signings of the Accords with the UAE and Bahrain. Just last week, I was proud to introduce the Bipartisan Israel Relations Normalization Act to build on the possibilities created by the Abraham Accords. I am hopeful for progress towards peace, but we must also remain ever vigilant in addressing the threats to the Jewish state, none graver than the threat of Iran acquiring a nuclear weapon. I will continue to do everything in my power to ensure that never happens. What Congress does is certainly important, and just as important is the work you all do. That's why I am so happy that you have chosen to be a part of this conference. Know that your voices are heard and that the work you do truly makes a difference. Over the past 73 years, Israel has become a country of prosperity, innovation, and growth. Over that time, the bonds between the U.S. and Israel have grown ever stronger. I will never stop advocating for a Jewish, secure, democratic Israel and working for enhancing, enhancing and strengthening the longstanding friendship between our two countries. Hello, I'm Congresswoman Elaine Luria from Virginia, and it's my privilege to address the American Zionist movement. I wish we could gather in person for an event like this, but I hope everyone is doing their best to stay safe and healthy as we continue to climb out of this global pandemic. Today we celebrate our nation's strong relationship with Israel and our Jewish American heritage and identities. From my experience as a 20-year Navy veteran and a Jewish member of Congress, I know that Israel is our closest ally in the Middle East, and I'm committed to supporting policies that will advance the U.S.-Israel bilateral relationship and enhance our regional security. At a time when Israel's detractors are seeking to delegitimize the Jewish state at every opportunity, the pro-Israel community must continue to provide strong support for Israel. I'm optimistic that the Abraham Accords are a beginning of normalizing Israel's relationship with Gulf Cooperation Council countries in the Middle East, and I hope that more nations will follow the UAE and Bahrain. Continued U.S. leadership in the Middle East is critical to combating Iran's malign activities in the region, including their pursuit of a nuclear weapon, which poses an existential threat to Israel. This Congress, I am also committed to working with my fellow lawmakers to combat anti-Semitism. Through my seat on the House Homeland Security Committee, the House Armed Services Committee, and as Jewish woman, I'm committed to eradicating anti-Semitism in all forms and look forward to a continued partnership with organizations like yours to advance this goal. I thank everyone here for their support of this important cause and wish you- Hi, it's Congressman Jamie Raskin from Maryland's beautiful 8th Congressional District. Uh, I'm just calling to send in my appreciation and all my best regards to my friends in the American Zionist movement. Uh, and I hope you have a terrific and productive conference. Hello, I'm Congresswoman Virginia Fox of North Carolina's 5th Congressional District. Israel remains a beacon of democracy to the world and its strong relationship with the United States is a testament to our shared values. The Zionist community continues to grow and prosper, not only through that relationship, but also by your tireless advocacy efforts. As a staunch supporter of Israel and the Jewish community, I will continue to fight for the pressing issues that you face. You can count on that. It's my hope that this year will foster conversations that will lead to meaningful and sustained growth. All blessings on you in your great work. In Zionist life, leadership is an important concept. It's not just a word. It's something that we put into action, and we do so in partnership with the volunteer leaders across the United States and around the world who are proud Zionist leaders, along with the professionals in uh, Jewish Zionist life, both from the national institutions uh, of Israel, and I refer to the World Zionist Organization, 
Karen Kayemet Israel, a Jewish national fund, the Jewish Agency for Israel, but also in the United States. The American Zionist movement works with the leadership of organizations across the spectrum of Jewish life, including Jewish federations of North America. חברים יקרים, שלום לכם, כאן, מהר הרצל בירושלים. הייתי מאוד שמח להגיע אליכם או שאתם תגיעו אלינו, אבל לצערנו זה נפצר מאיתנו. אנחנו מאוד מקווים שבפעם הבאה אני אוכל להגיע אליכם. ה-ACM משמשת שנים רבות כזרוע המרכזית של ההסתדרות הציונית העולמית בארצות הברית. אתם עושים עבודה נפלאה, ובשנים האחרונות ביתר שאת, מספר החברים ב-ACM הולך וגדל, וזה רק מראה שיש לנו פעילות אדירה, וזה רק מראה לכולנו שהרעיון הציוני חי וקיים ועושה, ואנחנו רוצים לחזק את הקשר של עם ישראל לארץ ישראל, ואנחנו רוצים לחזק את הקשר של העם היושב בציון לעם היושב בארצות הברית, ואתם עושים עבודה נפלאה בעניין הזה, ואנחנו נמשיך כאן. עם ההנהלה של ההסתדרות הציונית העולמית בישראל, להמשיך את הקשר איתכם ולהמשיך לעשות עשייה אדירה. אני רוצה לאחל לכם דיונים פורים, שיהיה רק טוב ושנמשיך לעשות טוב לעם ישראל ולארץ ישראל. בהצלחה לכולכם, כאן ברכה מירושלים. תודה רבה. ידידים יקרים, אני שמח לדבר בפניכם. באירוע חשוב זה שאתם נמצאים בו. ציונות היא אבן יסוד. אם אין ציונות, אין מדינה. אין סיבה למדינה. אין צורך במדינה. ועל בסיס הזה קמה מדינת ישראל. ולכן כל כך חשוב שהציונות תהיה לא רק בחוץ לארץ, כמו שמקובל לחשוב, שציונות זה עניין ליהודי הגולה, לתפוצות, אלא גם בתוך מדינת ישראל חייבת להיות ציונות. ואם יש התרופפות של הציונות בתוך מדינת ישראל, הכל מתרופף. החוסן, ההחזקה, היכולת לעמוד מול האויבים, היכולת להחזיק מעמד בכל מצב, כשאנחנו רואים שהיום בתפוצות ובצפון אמריקה בפרט יש התרחקות של הדור הצעיר מישראל, יש התרופפות של הקשר עם ישראל ביהדות התפוצות, זה מחייב אותנו להבין סימן שהציונות לא מספיק חזקה בתוכם. או שלא יודעים אותה לעומק, או לא מבינים את השלכותיה, כי אז הם היו מבינים שעם כל הביקורת על מדינת ישראל, אם יש להם, בין אם היא צודקת, בין אם היא לא צודקת, עם כל מה שלא מוצא חן ביניהם במדינת ישראל, בין אם זה בצדק או לא בצדק, זה לא צריך להשפיע על הקשר שלהם למדינת ישראל, שחייב להיות קשר של אחים, קשר כמו בתוך משפחה, שאיננו... תלוי בשום דבר, כי זה הבסיס של החיבור היום בין יהודי הגולה לבין מדינת ישראל, זה הציונות. הציונות היא זו שמהווה את הדבק שמחבר את היהודים בחוץ לארץ היום עם, עם, עם מדינת ישראל. פעם זה היה הדת, היהדות, והיום בדור כזה של התבוללות, של התרחקות מהדת, מה שיכול להמשיך ולהחזיק את הקשר למדינת ישראל זה הציונות. מה שמקשר בין כל היהודים בתפוצות למדינת ישראל. מכאן צריכים להבין שזו חובתנו של כל קבוצה וקבוצה שלנו בתפוצות. כל פדרציה ציונית, AZM ואחרים, בכל מקום ומקום, צריכים לקחת כמשימה. דחופה והכרחית לחזק את הציונות באותה ארץ, להקים מנהיגות צעירה ציונית עם אוריינטציה ציונית בתוך הקהילות, לוודא שהציונות היא המוטיב 
המוביל בתוך חיי הקהילה היהודית. ואת זה יכולים לעשות רק מי שמאמינים בזה, מי שתומכים בזה, וזה בראש ובראשונה אחריות שלכם. אני מאוד מקווה שברוח זאת תבנו את העתיד של פעולתכם, תכננו אותה כך, שבעזרת השם התוצאה תהיה שיתחזק הקשר למדינת ישראל, שתישאר קשר אמיתי וחזק של כל העם היהודי לנצח נצחים. תודה רבה. I think it is essential in the days that we live now, where there is enormous tension and strife between all parts of the Jewish world, the Jewish nation, including in the United States of America, where you hear, you hear a multitude of voices, that there is an umbrella organization that brings everybody together to a serious discussion about what Zionism is all about these days, about the connection to the state of Israel, about how to combat anti-Semitism and make an impact. And I'm especially proud that you guys are part and parcel of the World Zionist Movement, which Theodor Herzl founded, the WZO, as well as the Jewish Agency Board of Governors. I'm impacted by your work. I've seen it all over. Not long ago, we saw it in Poland. I saw it elsewhere in, in, in Washington as well, on Capitol Hill and otherwise. And I want to thank you and dear members of this conference for holding it and keeping on the fort and going strong day in, day out, because the mission has not ended. On the contrary, post-COVID, we will see more anti-Semitism. We will also see a lot of debates around Israel. And we have to instill the love of Israel, Avat Israel, and the notion of a nation state of the Jewish people, one and only of its kind, and its great importance to the Jewish people and the world at large. That's Lacha, good luck to all of you. Are your friends at the Jewish Agency congratulate you? Thank you to the American Zionist Movement Executive Director Herbert Block, AZM National Board Chair, Dr. Francine Stein, and longtime AZM, AZM president and my friend Richard Heidemann for including us in this virtual gathering. As chairman of the board of the governors of the Jewish Agency for Israel, I'm thrilled to be a part. For those of us who have been lifelong Zionists, it really is a crucial time now to talk about the crucial issues of the day. The Jewish Agency, the AZM, and the World Zionist Organization have been connected since the foundation of the State of Israel. And we're so proud of our collective resources and collaboration. And the Jewish Agency, as you know, works with the WZO, the Jewish Federations of North America, and Karen Hayasot every day to foster a Zionist dream. The leadership, the vision, and the work of the AZM, as well as the WZO, is what will ensure the Jewish people today and the Jews of tomorrow will stay connected and united. The Jewish Agency shares that vision as one of its major pillars. We have three, Aliyah, connecting Jews worldwide to the state of Israel, as well as fostering a improving Israel society. Lest we forget, we are privileged to live in a world where there is a Jewish nation, whether it's a state that Jews live in by choice or due to peril. Together with the AZM, we continue to work to foster a flourishing Jewish nation that feels connected to its fellow Jews and to the Jewish state. Good luck and thank you to the AZM for hosting this important discussion on Zionism and for bringing us all together. Toda Rabba. I'm Eric Fingerhut. I'm president and CEO of the Jewish Federations of North America. It's my great privilege to bring greetings from the board and officers of the Jewish Federations of North America and of all of our 146 Jewish federations and dozens uh, of network communities around North America who together and collectively represent the largest, most diverse, and most dynamic uh, Jewish leadership and philanthropic organization. Uh, we are so proud uh, of the work of the American Zionist Movement. Your role as convener of the, all of the large and diverse Zionist movements 
in North America. We're proud uh, of your role as the North American affiliate of the World Zionist Organization, with whom we partner uh, the Jewish federations in the leadership of the Jewish agency and in so many other roles uh, in leadership of the Jewish world. Uh, the Jewish federations uh, of North America have always been a bulwark uh, of the Zionist dream and love and passion of the North American Jewish community, helping to bring about the founding of the State of Israel through our leadership and philanthropy, helping to sustain it through its early years and through the many challenging crises that it faced. And today, uh, and Israel is the, the strong and dynamic and vibrant nation that we know of 73 years, proud again to partner in bringing Jews from all over the world to Israel and in building a long and permanent connection uh, between the Jewish community in North America and our brothers and sisters in the state of Israel, uh, our, uh, our national homeland. So we wish you uh, a successful biennial assembly. We thank you for your leadership work. I'm Israel Chai. My very dear friends, Shalom from Israel. As someone who identifies deeply with this gathering, who believes that the future of Zionism lies in the movement's engagement and activities, it gives me great pleasure to welcome and bring greetings to the AZM on behalf of the Zionist General Council and welcome your dedication and discussions on major issues of concern to all of us. We should never lose sight of the goal and vision of creating a society of excellence, Hebrat Mufet, that remains at the heart of every dialogue and agenda to create an empowered leadership that combines vision with reality. I pray that your deliberations will be conducted in the spirit of togetherness and partnership, that you will be able to build bridges and reconcile rifts between the different factions and positions within our people. We ask you to consider us partners in this dialogue sharing with you the challenges on the road ahead. I wish everyone a successful dialogue and productive encounters. It is such an honor for me to greet you today from Jerusalem, from this fine and historic building of the national institutions as the vice chairman of the World Zionist Organization. Chavirim v'chavirot, what a year we had, huh? No, I'm not talking about COVID and how it affected the world. I'm talking about politics. And to be more exact, I'm talking about politics in the Zionist movement. We had elections, then getting ready for the Zionist Congress, the first online Zionist Congress, and then the Congress itself. That was, well, in my opinion, one of the most important Zionist Congresses in the last few decades due to the fact that we were, and let's admit it, we were on the verge of a split in the Zionist movement. Yet we were able, all sides, to come together, to reach a decent agreement, and to make it clear to everyone that what unites us as Zionists is stronger and deeper than what separates us. The agreement we signed doesn't dismiss disputes but states clearly that we all are devoted Zionists who are committed to the core values of the Zionist movement with a strong commitment to the idea of a democratic and Jewish state and a firm recognition that the unity of the Jewish people is based on its diversity. We all stated and signed that we are fully committed to respecting different hashkafot, different outlooks within the Jewish people. Lechabed et arav goniyut ba'am ha'yehudi, a phrase that was taken from our Jerusalem program, underscores our common commitment to the Jewish idea of Jewish pluralism as a guiding principle and as a state of mind. 
The fact that we all did sign this agreement in the midst of an intense and disputed Congress makes me, as vice chairman, makes me optimistic. You look at this document for a second with the signatures of Mizrahi and Meretz, of Likud and Labour, of the Masorti movement and Shas, of the reform movement and Eretz Kodesh. And you understand how Zionism was able to take a dream and create reality. None of us loves politics, but as Herzl understood before the others did, that Zionism will only work when it acts as a political movement that knows how to take disagreements and create bridges. The day-to-day -day work at the World Zionist Organization, the day-to-day -day work in this building proves that it is possible. And I'm sure that it is also possible in our largest and strongest Zionist Federation, the American Zionist Movement, AZM. Dear friend, Shalom from Jerusalem. Who could have imagined that we would not be able to meet in person because of the severe restriction imposed by the worldwide pandemic? I have learned two new words in English, lockdown and quarantine. Two words that actually reflect challenges we have faced during the last year, the past year. How to communicate and to stay connected in times of lockdown and quarantine. With all the difficulties it posed, the situation also opened up a new window of opportunities in which to engage. Zoom, webinars, Facebook Live, and many more online platforms that allowed us to be in the same place and time, despite being thousands of miles apart uh, physically. Together with the AZM staff, we um, offered a variety of programs uh, branded as iVision Life, which offered lectures on different uh, themes. The programs were presented with the best lectures, good music and other elements. And of course, what seems to have become the symbol of the pandemic, cooking, which is known uh, for us as Cooking Up Hebrew. Uh, when Richard was elected, we put our heads together to think up uh, better ways to collaborate in fulfilling the mission of expanding the Zionist movement in the U.S. We uh, tried to involve more people, uh, especially young adults uh, in, in Zionism and Israel, on the assumption that there is more than one way to uh, explore Zionism. We choose to do the, uh, this at the time that more and more people seem to be disengaged from Israel. We worked together, you and I, and our th team to make it happen. It is not an easy task, as you all know. But then again, we are not afraid of long journeys. The last year was a challenging year, not only because of COVID-19, but also because of the election to the Zionist Congress. Politics, my friends, always requires a ton of energy and is not always pleasant or clean. I wish you, the leadership and all the members of the AZM, the strength to find ways to accept and embrace the segments of the Jewish community and all political points of view. As our famous writer Yuda Amichai wrote in one of his uh, famous poems, he wrote this, from the place where we are right, Flowers will never grow in the spring. I hope and pray that the leadership of the AZM will find the wisdom and the power to respect differences and to seek out what unites us in order uh, to ensure the future of the, of the Jewish people. I would like once again to thank each and every one of you, particularly those of the leadership, as it said 
עם פרקי אבות, לא עליך המלאכה לגמור, ואין אתה חופשי להיבטל ממנה. It is not for your responsibility to finish the work of perfecting the world, but you are not free to desist from its either. Next year I wish us in Jerusalem. בשנה הבאה בירושלים. Good luck to you. Indeed, it was Theodore Herzl's vision that has led to the reality of Israel. What he envisioned was a state for the Jewish people, and what we have today is a state for all of the Jewish people and all of Israel's citizens without regard to their race or religion or their sexual orientation or their nat national origin or their culture or the language they may speak or the preferences they may have in any certain aspect of their lives. Vision to us means equality, that all people shall be able to participate, enjoy and appreciate Israel as a visionary state. Please welcome Alicia Post, the AZM National Program and Communications Director, who will introduce our next speakers and program. Thank you. Hi, I'm Alicia Post. I am AZM's National Program and Communications Director. As you know, the theme is Zionism Forward. Leadership, vision, reality. In the spirit of vision, I am honored to have a conversation today with two people who exemplify that concept. Welcome to Dr. Naya Lecht and India Prasad. So let's start with you, Naya. Can you please tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to be the Zionist you are today? Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm so honored um, to be one of your guest speakers. Um, so a little bit about myself is I was born in the former Soviet Union and that's an important um, part of my identity as a Zionist and a Jew, which I believe is interlinked and, and, and um, exchangeable. Um, I was born there and I came here when I was six years old I didn't experience the totalitarian regime, but my parents did. And so they told me a lot of stories about what it meant to be a Jew in the Soviet Union. And the interesting thing is that to be a Jew in the Soviet Union was an ethnic identity. It was not a religious um, identity. Uh, whereas for American Jews, the counterpart here, the, it's the religious identity and not the ethnic. And so the kind of Zion, so Zionism is very much part of Russian Jewish identity because Zionism is an ethnic identity, a peoplehood identity. And so it's so easy to embrace for a Russian speaking Jew like myself, uh, who was raised by parents who understood that to be a Jew is to be part of an Am Yisrael, a people of Israel, a Jewish people. And so uh, the type of Zionist I am is one that is very much informed by peoplehood um, and not per se by religion. So, and that is a very important distinction um, to, to be made for American Jewry, which we can discuss later on. But that means that I very much believe that I am, that Israel is the ancestral homeland of the Jewish people. I'll just tell you a very small anecdote. Uh, when my mother was in the Soviet Union, um, one day she was on a trolley bus and a woman approached her and said an anti-Semitic thing to her. And what did she say? She said, oh, I know you wanna get out of here because Jews wanted to leave. And she said, so just go, go back to Palestine. Because in the mind of the, uh, the non-Jew in the Soviet Union, the Russian, Palestine meant Jewish homeland. Um, and that's something uh, American Jews struggle with is that and, and understanding that Israel is the homeland of the Jewish people, but Soviet Jews, Russian speaking Jews, it's, it's, it's a very short conversation. So yes, my Zionism is very much informed by an, ident an ethnic identity, uh, what Gil Troy calls sometimes identity Zionism. Amazing, so that's we actually helped. heard from Gil just a little bit before. And India, can you tell us a little bit about 
the Zionist you are? Absolutely. Well, I want to thank AZM for inviting uh, Naya and I to speak. Naya, I think your story is incredible and I can't wait to hear what else you have to say. But my name is India. I'm the creator and host of a digital series called Inside Israel at I-24 News. I live in Tel Aviv right now at the moment. Um, and also speaking of what Naya is saying, I, I am Jewish and she mentioned identity Zionism. So from a young age, I, I was raised and taught that Israel is important to the Jewish people and to our faith. So in that way, I, I do support Israel. And I was involved a lot with the Halal at my university, at the University of Georgia. And there we did a lot of pro-Israel activities. And that really inspired me to move to Israel after graduation to essentially share Israel to the world um, right where all the action is happening. So for many, particularly generationally, the perception of Zionism is not often used um, and is seen as divisive. As you know, at AZM, we pride ourselves on embracing Zionism in all its forms. Um, it, is this an issue in terms of your Zionist activities? How do you deal with this? How does it guide you in your work? Um, I guess, Naya, do you wanna begin? Sure, this is a very important question. And in, in embedded in this question is a deeper issue of how has Zionism been taught and how has Zionism been um, served, if you will, to American Jewry and as a political movement, as an ism? And that is the biggest tragedy, I think, of uh, the established Jewish establishment of the way that they teach anti-Zion, I mean, sorry, Zionism. I went to a Jewish day school almost through high school. And I thought that before Herzl, there was nothing. I thought Herzl had invented the idea that Jews should, should, should have a homeland. Um, the, the issue with the way that Zionism is presented to American Jews is a, a political movement. And what have they done? They've divorced it in many ways from identity. Uh, because, all right, it's true. Zionism was part of the 19th century movements, the isms, the nationalism, the socialism. This is not, not true. It is a political movement, but if we only, only look at it that way, we're doing a grave disservice to our Jews in the diaspora. And I'm talking about American Jews because they see it as Zionism over there. And I am a Jew and they don't understand that the two are inextricably linked. So that what happens when somebody like Linda Sarsour says, uh, Jews are welcome, Zionists are not, or you have to check your Zionism at the door, a lot of Jews go, okay, I understand they make concessions. No, that you don't under, there, there is no concessions to be made there. You can, this is a, they're dividing who you are and they're reframing, they're redefining the Jewish identity. Uh, Zionism may be a political movement, but the idea of Zion, that idea is as old as the Jewish people. So to your question, is it divisive? Yes but it's because we have approached it and we have served it incorrectly. So that's my answer. Thank you. Yeah. I strongly believe in meeting on common ground when it comes to yeah, Zionism, it, as, as uh, broad as a spectrum as it, it can be. Uh, there are so many people against Israel that we don't need more fragmentation amongst those who do support Israel and Zionism in, in whatever capacity they choose to. And that's why personally in my work, I, I choose to focus on, on my energy on what, what we can agree on. I see so much more success in reaching people, especially online when I do this. For example, when I talk about food or culture or music, most of us can agree on that. And it extends our reach beyond just the, the Jewish community and into a lot of countries um, that have strong bonds with Israel, including maybe Israel and the Philippines that maybe don't have uh, large Jewish populations or any Jewish populations at all. But uh, these sort of videos uh, rally people together um, b uh, behind a, this cause of Zionism. And um, it's a cause that we should absolutely pursue and a strategy we should absolutely pursue. 
Absolutely. So let's talk about your thoughts on the future. It's a big question. What do you envision the Zionist movement in America to be like in 20 years? What do you personally think that the state of Israel will be like? How will the work that you're doing have a role in shaping it? Um, so why don't we start with you, India? So in 20 years, I see the Zionist movement in the United States growing significantly. I think we are going to see an increase of the number of Jews making Aliyah, and I'm very excited for it. In Israel, I want to see mutual peace between Jews and Arabs. And in regards to the work in the, the media, I think the videos we are producing at I-24 News have tremendous reach and, and with every piece of content we put out, not even just myself as an individual, but all the content creators that are pro-Israel and supporting Zionism, for with every video we create, we are rallying the support for the cause of Israel and for the cause of peace. It's, um, it's beautiful. Um, I, I, I share your sentiment, but I wanna take a step back if I, if I may. Um, to, to address the question, um, I'm very much, uh, in, I think that we need to stay, take a step back and look at American Jewry. And it's very important to note that when American Jews came, the first settlers to here in about 1880, there was a very famous platform called the Pittsburgh Platform of 1885. And what did they do? They embraced a religious identity and they jettisoned an ethnic identity. Meaning they basically, it was a manifesto that said, we the Jews uh, understand ourselves to be a religious minority. We fully embrace our religious um, identity. And I understand why they would do that American Jews because this country was founded on religious freedom, freedom for religious minorities. So they needed to, couch their uh, language in order to fit the American um, context. The ripple effect, the intergenerational effect from that, from 1880, where they embrace a religious identity, but eschew this ethnic identity, is what we see now, which is a, a very big gap, and it's, it's a tragic, a very big gap between American Jews and their um, love, embrace, um, identity with Israel and it's growing and growing wider and wider. It's growing wider and wider and wider because American Jews are no longer seeing themselves as a people, a Jewish people, but rather a religious minority. And kind of, that's kind of funny, you know, if you zoom out in Jewish history, the Russian Jews were robbed of their religious identity and embraced the ethnic and the American Jews were robbed of the ethnic and embrace the religious. So um, India is very optimistic. I tend to be more realistic. Um, I do see um, a, a big challenge is what I see. I may see a big challenge for redefining um, Judaism. And I work in the teen space. So I work with them um, mostly with teens. And I see with my job with teens, how if before, in our curriculum, which is at Club Z, we begin by talking about the Arab-Israeli conflict and we take for granted, okay, they understand that this is the ancestral homeland, that we are part of the people of Israel. Now we have to take two ginormous steps back and, and do a lot of that work with American youth where we remind them. It's really reminding that you are part of a people um, and that maybe, just maybe identifying it as a religion um, is actually hurting the cause. But, but India, you are right. There are people who are making Aliyah more and more, but I do see the challenge. And my, if I were like, a, if I was a doctor and I was prescribing uh, a method for curing this, it would be to remind American Jews through education that we are a people. It's very important. I think Avram Enfeld said really famously, Ju Judaism is not a religion. Ju and he's kind of, Judaism is not a religion, it's an ethnicity. And that's absolutely correct. And when we teach that to our teens, especially our American teens, they're, they fight me. They're like, no, 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 we're a religious minority. And I'm like, no, no, we're a people. Um, so the future of Israel, 
um, depends on Jews in America. And Jews in America need, need to be re-educated is what I'm saying. Um, so with that and your work with teens, I guess, um, are there any goals that you have in continuing to promote Zionism? My goal is, so I work with teens right in Club Z. My goal is for them to understand that Zionism does not begin with Herzl. So something that we introduce them to is the idea of proto-Zionism. We say Moses, Abraham, they were the first Zionists, right? We talk about language and the birth of the Zion Zionism is a 19th century construct, just like as we talk about nationalism, communism. And really it's, it's very liberating for them to say, oh wait, the, yes, the word may have been created in the 19th century, but the idea of Zion is, is so, it's so part of us. It's, it's it, you know, somebody uh, saying something disgusting about Jews and their, you know, Shabbat is equally disgusting when they, you know, say something terrible about Israel. It's equal. Um, so we do a lot of identity Zionism um, where we teach them and we, we talk about it through heavy discussions. What does it mean to be a Jew? It's not just um, rituals that are, you know, codified in, in halakha, in, but it's, by the way, there are halakha that are codified that are about Israel. Um, it's about a really strong connection with Israel. It's very, very important. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what we're doing. We're building this new generation of American Jews, shaping their identity. And this is, it's, it's kind of an interesting moment where the Russian Jews who've kind of been laying dormant are now giving back in many ways, I believe, and are re-entering the conversation in for American Jews and are telling them, kind of reminding them from the slumber, waking them up to say, you know what, you're part of a people. No, it's not just a religious identity. Amazing. Um, as we're concluding, um, India, as a, a blogger, a social media influencer, and of course, um, you know, your work in the media, um, what would you say maybe goals for you to continue to promote Zionism? Well, I wanted to mention uh, one thing before I answer for Naya, you know, it's interesting how you bring up this religious identity versus an ethnic uh, identity and the process of al Aliyah, uh, and I'm personally going through it right now, it, it's very interesting that you bring up this point because it, it is very much a religious identity process. They want documents of Ketuba, they want uh, documents, uh, religious documents to prove Judaism. If I handed them a DNA test, which I do have, uh, they wouldn't accept it. So it's very fascinating that, uh, that's that's the way that they uh, verify your Jewish identity. So moving on, um, as this uh, blogger, content creator um, at I24 News and on my personal accounts, I, I plan to continue to show Israel through the media. There, there's I don't have any other option. I know it's my strength and we have to use our strengths, all of us is on, 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 on the same team, we use our strengths at what we're good at to um, show Israel to the world. And after all, it's the media that connects us all. Um, and instead of using it to divide, I, I want to choose to use it as a tool to give Israel a voice and also inspire other creators, other young teens and people who are just online um, watching the videos, inspire them to make videos and share their experience about Israel about their Jewish identity and the interconnectedness and all of that. Amazing. Well, um, I do want to also mention, I know, um, Naya, another thing that you'll do, I know you're a finalist in our Zionist Education Accelerator, so I'm really excited about that. And India, I know that, um, you know, we've discussed it before, but that you were a recipient of our HBR scholarship, um, which also helped, you know, hopefully in, in your journey. And Kola Kavod, Batlacha, we wish you so much luck um, with your journey of making Aliyah and of course are here to support you. And you really, um, for both of you, we just look forward to continuing to do this work together. Um, so thank you both so much for joining us. Um, and thank you to everyone here today with us. Um, you know, I really hope that this conversation um, helped to spark or um, helped you to gain some insight on how we can continue to move Zionism forward and the role that you can play. So thank you so much. Thank you.
So good to meet you, India. It's Thank great. you. Thank you. In our effort to make a difference regarding the attitudes that are so wrongly displayed at the United Nations toward Israel, we have worked hand in hand with Ambassador Danny Danone, Israel's 17th permanent representative to the United Nations. Together we took 100 UN ambassadors from 66 different countries, over two years, four separate delegations, along with our partner, the March of the Living. We believe that we were able to give those ambassadors a sense of Holocaust history, some Holocaust education, and by taking them onto Israel, a sense of Israel today, the reality. We appreciate the leadership of Ambassador Danone, and we also appreciate the individual ambassadors who participated with us. You'll hear from one of them, uh, Ambassador Max Huffenen Rye, the ambassador and permanent representative of Papua New Guinea to the United Nations. Shalom to all my friends from the American Zionist movement. I want to congratulate you and I want to thank you for five great years where we worked together and we achieved so much. We did so much at the UN with the ambassadors and I will always remember the special missions with the March of the Living where the American Zionist movement actually took the initiative and helped to bring dozens of UN ambassadors to Poland and to Israel. I still speak with many of my friends from around the world about the great experiences they had in Israel. We know we can count on you. We know that you will be there for Israel no matter what. Only a few days ago, we celebrated our independence. We should not take it for granted. We should cherish our unity. And the fact today in the AZM, you see groups from all the spectrum. It is something we should not take for granted. I want to send best wishes to my dear friend, President Richard Heidman. You did a great job, Richard, and I am sure you will do great things for the Jewish people. We are waiting for all of you here in Israel. Here everything is open and we can start speaking about post-COVID life. So hopefully we'll be able to see you soon here in Jerusalem. On behalf of my country, Papua New Guinea, and on my own behalf, I extend warm greetings and felicitations on the important occasion of the American Zionist Movement meeting from the 3rd to the 4th of May, 2021. May I also say thank you for the kind invitation extended to us, my colleagues and I, ambassadors to the United Nations. And we also want to thank you very much and Ambassador Denny Dunon, who recently returned to Israel, and Mr. Richard Heidelman, and others who made it possible for us to visit Israel and the hospitality that you were able to provide. In this connection, I want to sincerely thank you once again, the ASM, AZM, for inviting me with the other United Nations ambassadors to visit Poland and visit Treplinka, the other prison and mil where millions of Jews were kept and executed, and later to visit Israel. Thank you for fulfilling my childhood dream of visiting Poland, where over three million Jews were executed, and onto Israel, where Jesus was born, lived, preached, and was executed. As a Catholic, I am a Jewish follower. So are all Papua New Guineans, people in my country, love Israel as Bible-based Christians and with Israel every prosperity, love and friendship. Thank you. One of the truly visionary leaders of Israel with whom we have worked so closely is the Natan Sharansky, a prisoner of Zion, former minister in Israeli governments and former chair of the Jewish Agency for Israel. 
Natan Sharansky stood up during his term and stands up today against anti-Semitism, against anti-Israelism, against the distortion and the denial of both the history of the Jewish people, of the Holocaust, and, and of those who abuse and demonize Israel. Please listen to the important words from Natan Sharansky. Dear friends, greetings from Jerusalem. American Zionist movement includes dozens of Jewish organizations with different political agendas, social aims, and so on. And in our polarized times, it's especially important to remember that with all our differences, what unites us is much stronger. What unites us is our mutual desire to continue to be one family and to continue our mutual journey through thousands of years, sticking to our values, being or the green, uh, sticking to our dreams and our prayers. And Zionism, that's exactly the glue, that's exactly what connects us, is our eternal connection between Jewish people and the land of Israel, our strong desire to have our state which will guarantee our survival and which will strengthen, empower every Jewish community in the world. So let's remember what unites us. Let's strengthen American Zionist movement. We're so pleased to have received a special message from Dr. Ruth Westheimer, author, professor, and a psychosexual therapist. She has some interesting words to share today. Hello, all of you at the American Zionist Movement. I'm Dr. Ruth K. Westheimer, and I am wearing the Ben-Gurion pin because I just got my honorary doctorate from Ben-Gurion University in the Negev and I wish all of you all the very best. My entire life, since the age of 12, when I was in the orphanage in Switzerland, I have been a Zionist. I've been going to Israel every single year. Next year, I'll go again. Shalom, uvracha, v'kol tov. I'm Dr. Ruth K. Westheimer. Rabbi Paul Gollum has uh, done an excellent job as the AZM Vice President for Programming. He has worked uh, now for four years to see to it that quality Zionism programs like today are brought to you. Please welcome Rabbi Paul Gollum. In 1902, Theodor Herzl asked Martin Buber to serve as editor of the Zionist journal Die Welt. It was an extraordinary act on Herzl's part. Not only did he recognize the brilliance and potential of the 23-year-old Buber, but he was also reaching across an ideological divide. Herzl promoted the political approach to Zionism, while Buber, a devotee of a Hada Am, represented a cultural and spiritually Jewish approach. The arrangement did not last long, but the mutual respect between the two men endured, as would friendship between Buber and Herzl's heir, David Ben-Gurion, many years later. Thus, from the very start, Zionism has embodied the quality of Jewish pluralism. As the vice president for programming for the AZM, I have been especially sensitive to the innate pluralism of the Zionist movement. Every board meeting and assembly has been a gathering of self-consciously diverse Jews, religiously liberal and orthodox, politically left and right wing. Such direct contact among diverse Jews is rare and yet the norm for every AZM meeting. What do such circumstances portend? How can pluralism be restrained from descending into separate camps, only politely acknowledging each other's existence but not really willing to listen to each other. Centuries before Herzl and Buber, the Talmud discussed the rivalry between the schools of Hillel and Shammai. 
They argued and disagreed on most everything until a heavenly voice declared that these and these are the words of the living God. The voices also asserted that Hillel's opinions are to be preferred. The Talmudic sages then wonder why, if both positions are blessed by God, that Hillel's are superior. And the answer that Hillel was actually attentive to what Shammai had to say, that his school molded their position in the context of thoughtful opposition and not merely as a firm declaration that they are right. The Zionist movement is made up of multiple Hillels and Shammais. There are schools who emphasize physical security in the hostile world, those who propose that the acceptance of risk is necessary in order to preserve moral clarity. There are schools who turn to tradition in order to withstand the corrosive effects of a changing world and those who invite the change as a path to redemption. These and these are the words of the living God. It is now my honor to introduce representatives from the three of the principal streams of Jewish thought within the Zionist movement. Rabbi Eitan Hammerman from Merkaz of Conservative Judaism, Dr. Ernest H. Agatstein from the Orthodox Religious Zionists of America, and Rabbi Rachel Miller from the Reform Movement's Artsa. As they each engage in a brief teaching about Zionism out of the Jewish sources, I invite you to listen attentively to their visions. The result may not be a matter of common ground, but I hope that it will lead us to higher ground. Hi, I'm Rabbi Rachel Klein Miller, representing ARTSA, the Association of Reform Zionists of America. The project of Zionism today is to determine how to serve all of the Jewish people in the state of Israel. This means that the Zionism of the future requires a big tent where we are open to sitting with people with whom we disagree for the sake of continuing to fulfill the Zionist dream. That is our right to self-determination in our historic and sacred homeland. We envision an Israel that represents the highest ideals of Jewish peoplehood. So let us continue to work for a modern state of Israel, one that is inclusive, moral, and a home for us all. Ki mitzion teitzei Torah, from out of Zion will come the Torah. May we fulfill the call of the prophet Isaiah and bring Torah to the rest of the world. May we continue to work together for the sake of a Jewish and democratic state. And may our shared love of the land, the people, and the state allow us to continue to breathe the breath of life into the Zionist cause. Shalom, I'm Rabbi Eitan Hammerman. If you've ever tried to drive up to Jerusalem in a real rainstorm, you know that it's not a pretty scene. And it certainly wasn't pretty when the roads were much worse than they are today, back on Tu Bishvat, 1995. I was 18 years old and our gap year native program run by the conservative movement was brought out to Hill 16 to move rocks and realign boulder walls and of course plant trees. Well, in the driving rainstorm, you can imagine how much fun that was. And after not too much time, our work had sort of devolved into a muddy, well, mud fight. We were brought back to Jerusalem. The plan was to go back to our, our base and change clothes before going to Hebrew University for class. But the traffic was so bad in the Jerusalem rain that we had to go straight to the university. I always sat in the front row of class and when my professor looked up and saw me sitting there covered in mud, what are you doing? How'd you get here like that? I said, today's Tu Bishvat, we planted trees. Ah, okay, Zeba said there, it's okay. He let us stay in class looking like that. Why did I tell you the silly story? Because our two parshiot this coming Shabbat, Bahar B'chul Gotai, are all about following God's laws and being rewarded with rain and land. If we take care to follow God's instructions, including giving the land a break, we'll all be blessed with a wonderful inheritance. My kids at the LaFell School here in Westchester County, New York, recently began their first in-depth study of Zionism. They'd studied Israel before in school, of course, 
but my eighth graders, I have twins born at Hadassah Hospital. My eighth graders are understanding now that Zionism long before the creation of the state of Israel was always multifaceted. The kids have learned about Herzl and they've learned about Achad Ha'am. They've learned about all of the different groups that made up the Zionist movement that came together in the first Zionist Congress in 1897. So too should that model be the case for us today. For us to be blessed with rain, for us to be blessed with a good land, we have to continue to act in the spirit of the founder of political Zionism, Benjamin Zev Herzl, making space for all Zionists. Shavua Tov. Welcome, chaverim and chaverot. My name is Ernie Agatstein. I'm one of the presidents of the Religious Zionists of America. Uh, the, we're now in the Sphira period of Sphira Omer, counting the Omer from the second day of Passover all the way until Shavuos. It's not a coincidence, in my opinion, that the two Israeli national holidays of Yom Atzmaut and Yom Yushalayim, both of them appear during the Sphira period. The Sphira period ends with the holiday of Shavuos where we receive the Torah. But it's very interesting in the Dayenu that we said at the Seder night, we said, Even if you had brought us the Jewish people to the foot of Harsinai and not given us the Torah, it would have been enough. We have to ask ourselves, what's the whole point of going to Mount Sinai? Isn't it to receive the Torah? What is gathering at the foot of Harsinai uh, such an event that we say Dayenu without it, uh, it would have been enough. So, we know the famous Rashi when it says, Israel neged ahar, that the Jewish people on the first day of Siva, when they arrived to Harsina, they encamped at the foot of the mountain. The word Vayichan is singular, not plural. It says Rashi, Vayichan, it should say Vayachanu, it said Vayichan, ki ishechad belevachad. That the Jewish people, when they arrived at Harsina, they were unified. It was like one person with one heart. It's in that situation we can receive the Torah. Similarly, during the Sphira period, 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva passed away. And our rabbis teach us they did so because they didn't treat each other with respect. They weren't unified. They had sinas chinam instead of avas chinam. They had baseless hatred instead of avas, uh, free, free love which we know the destruction of the second temple was because of sinas chinam, baseless hatred. We as a Jewish people have to be unified. I've heard it say that during the 1948 independence war, there was a lot of factionalism. There was the Irgun, there was the Palmach, there was Eitzel, there was the Stern Gang. And for that reason, we were not able to hold on to Jerusalem. But 19 years later, 1967, during the Six Day War, the Jewish people were very unified, not only in Israel, but around the world. All of diaspora Jewry came in support of the state of Israel and therefore we were able to get Jerusalem back. I say this now as we gather during this period of time for the AZM, let's have one heart. We're unified as a people. No matter we are, whatever streams we're in, whatever factions we are in, there's no factionalism when it comes to the Jewish people. We're one people with one goal, strengthening the state of Israel and we're all going to work for that. Chag Sameach for Chag Ashvos that's coming up. As a part of our theme of this uh, AZM National Zionism Conference, uh, the theme of Zionism Forward, Leadership, Vision, and Reality, we included reality so that together we could concentrate on the reality of the modern state of Israel. The reality of the Jewish people having our own state. The reality of the challenges that the Jewish people face. The challenges that Zionism faces. The challenges that Israel faces. In the court of public opinion, at the United Nations, with diplomats, and in our own community. Please welcome Herbert Block, the AZM Executive Director who will introduce further our presenters on reality. Hello, I'm Herbert Block, Executive Director of the American Zionist Movement. Thank you for joining our program today. 
For more than 20 years, one aspect of AZM's work connecting American Jews to Israel has been HBR, or Helen B. Reich Scholarship Program. Scholarships are awarded each fall and spring to a limited number of American Jewish students who choose to study at a designated Israeli university or to attend post-college programs in Israel. In a few moments, you will hear from a few of the nearly 200 young American Jews who have benefited from an AZM HBR scholarship and were able to spend time in Israel. Scholarship applications are now open for fall 2021 until July 1st at, du- at azm.org slash HBR. Hi, AZM. My name is Julia Rubenstein, and I am one of the recipients of the HBR scholarship. I am in Israel for the semester studying at Pardes Institute of Jewish Studies. And so far, my experience has been so wonderful. I'm learning so much about Judaism, about Israel, uh, and, and how I can be an advocate for Israel in the future. And AZM has helped me make this possible by uh, helping me financially to be able to be here and to allow me to continue to explore my Judaism and my connection with Israel. So thank you so much. I'm so excited to continue learning and to continue to be an advocate for Israel. Thank you so much to AZM and the Helen B. Reich Scholarship for helping me get here to Tel Aviv, Israel. Um, my name is Rachel Duche. I've been to Israel many times. Um, I've toured here, I've been a student here, and now it's my first time having a professional experience here. Um, I go to meetings in Hebrew, I do business with Israelis, and it's really incredible. Um, I'm so happy to be able to continue my relationship and connection with Israel and also share the experience with friends back home, Jewish and non-Jewish, to really show them what daily life in Israel is like and help kind of promote Israel's image. Um, And it wouldn't have been possible without help from AZM. Um, I really appreciate the help, so thank you so much. Growing up in Phoenix, Arizona, my family did not have the resources to travel to the East Coast, let alone overseas. And the idea of studying and living in Israel was really not even on my radar. Uh, But thanks to the Helen B. Reich Scholarship and the American Zionist Movement's support of that scholarship, I had a deeply formative experience at Tel Aviv University in 2003, which has sparked my lifelong journey. Today, as the Executive Director of Israel Policy Forum, I'm working every day uh, to ensure a safe, secure uh, Israel, uh, peace and security alongside its neighbors, uh, to ensure a secure Jewish and democratic Israel for generations to come. Uh, This has all sparked from that experience back uh, some 18 years ago with thanks to the Helen B. Reich Scholarship. Uh, Thank you to the American Zionist Movement, and I hope you have a wonderful event. Hello, my name is Jeremy Pesner, and it was my distinct pleasure to be offered a Helen B. Reich Scholarship by the American Zionist Movement in the spring of 2018. I was working and studying in Israel under the Israel Government Fellows Massa program, interning as a data and policy analyst at Startup Nation Central while attending many informative lectures and events around the political, cultural, and religious aspects of Israel. The Reich Scholarship helped me to not only defray the program's substantial costs, but to reflect on my own evolving relationship with Zionism and how I could best support the Jewish state even though I never intended to live there permanently. I recognize that support can come in many forms, such as activism, volunteer leadership, or evangelism. I have elected to show Israel to others the way it was shown to me. Since returning to the States, I have led a birthright trip and intend to lead an iTrek trip in the near future, demonstrating Israel's value not only to the Jewish people, but to people all around the world. Hello, my name is Justin Pollack. I'm from Broward County, Florida. I participated in the Woodges Jerusalem Learning Program in 2008 and 2009 thanks to the support of the American Zionist Movement and the Helen B. Reich Scholarship that I received in 2008. My six months in Israel was nothing short of incredible, and it was such an amazing, formative experience for me, who I already was so involved in Jewish life uh, before that. But having the opportunity to live and be in Israel for six months um, truly was one of the best things I've ever done in my life. Uh, Fast forward to today, I'm a father to two kids, um, and Israel and Zionism and Judaism are such a critical part, an important part of our lives. Um, I I don't know where I'd be without the support of the American Zionist Movement and my time in Wujis. So thank you so much. Hello, my name is Sarah Bechor. 
the opportunity to spend a part of my formative undergraduate years studying in Israel left an immeasurable impact on both my academic and professional career paths, solidified my unwavering Zionist and pro-Israel views and my personal commitment to the Jewish community and deepened my lifelong passion for the study of foreign affairs, U.S.-Israel relations, and Israeli politics. I learned from the perspectives shared by other students who hailed from all corners of the world, saw at close range a direct impact of the policies, events, and trends I was actively studying, and discovered new areas of interest, such as high-tech entrepreneurship. This experience paved the way for countless return trips to Israel for study and business throughout the years that followed, and the friendships and insights I gained continue to be ones I look to for inspiration in my career, as well as in my life as a proud Zionist Jew and American. Thank you to the Helen B. Reich Scholarship Program and the American Zionist Movement. As we are speaking of our American Jewish connection to Israel and Zionism, let me tell you about one of my personal favorites that will be especially significant this summer. As many know, the Israel national baseball team has qualified for the Olympics. Many of the players are American Jews who made Aliyah in order to be on the team. As a fan of baseball and Israel, I am very excited to watch them compete for a medal in Tokyo. Join us in cheering on the team as America's national pastime is played by a team from our Jewish national homeland. In AZM, we have Zionists of all persuasions, but we can come together from right, center, and left field to support Team Israel. Stay tuned for some special messages. Welcome to the uh, American Zionist uh, Movement uh, Conference. My name is Peter Kurtz, and I'm the general manager of National Team Israel in baseball that's going to the Olympic Games this summer in Tokyo in July. As you can see up here, um, Team Israel qualified for the Olympics in the summer of 2019, and we're thrilled to be able to go there and represent our country in baseball. The Olympic Games and our national team is a culmination of the work of many, many years of many people in Israel baseball, bringing together um, American Jewish baseball players who made Aliyah, who came to Israel, made Aliyah, and are joining their Israeli brothers, and were able to qualify in the summer of 2019 um, as the European representatives to the Olympics. As you can see, see behind me, in 2017, we played in the World Baseball Classic. Not many people uh, thought we could get very far. We won the qualifiers in Brooklyn in 2016. There was a famous documentary movie called Heading Home, made about the team and their visit to Israel in 2017. And in 2017, we went to Korea and, and Japan and Tokyo uh, to play in the WBC. We won our first three games in Korea, and we even won the fourth game uh, in Tokyo against uh, the Cuban national team. Imagine Israel national team defeating the Cuban national team in baseball. That's quite an achievement. ESPN, before the tournament, called us the Jamaican bobsled team, but I think after the tournament we proved that we belonged. Out of 16 teams, Israel came in in sixth place, and today we're ranked number 18 in the world in baseball. To be ranked number 18 is very, very symbolic, especially in this Olympic year. It's high, and everybody knows how important it is to be high. So Team Israel um, approached 2019 and the, uh, and the Olympic qualifiers, trying to put together our best possible team. For the Olympics, you need to be citizens. You need to make you make you need to have citizenship, as opposed to the World Baseball Classic, where you can only qualify for citizenship. It's called the heritage rule. But in the Olympics, we brought first ten players, Amer Jewish American ball players, who made Aliyah and came to live in Israel and to pay, play for Israel. And later on, we added four more, and we added a few more afterwards, and we were able to qualify as Team Israel. Last year, before the Corona crisis. Ian Kinsler, one of the best Jewish players ever to play Major League Baseball, retired. And when I approached him about coming to Israel to make Aliyah, he readily agreed. Came to Israel just before the corona went into effect. Uh, made, became an Israeli, made Aliyah, got an Israeli passport. Uh, unfortunately, we were supposed to go to the Olympics in 2020. They've been, they've been postponed. They were postponed until the summer of 2021, four months from now. We'd love to see you all there. Um, unfortunately, you won't be able to go to the Olympics, but we'd love to see you all watching on television. We'll be having our uh, training camps, both in Arizona uh, in mid-May, 
and as well as in the Northeast United States from July 5th to 21st. We'll be doing a barnstorming tour of 10, 10 locations and 10 games um, in New York, in Connecticut, in Maryland, in Pennsylvania. We'd love to have you join those games. The schedule will be out shortly. Um, we're also in the midst of a fundraising campaign called our 25 campaign. We're sending 24 players, Israeli players, to Tokyo to play for Team Israel. But we want you, the Jewish people, to be the 25th player. This is Eric Holtz, head coach of the Israel national baseball team headed to the Olympics in a couple months. Uh, what does it mean to me uh, to be involved with Israel baseball, to re be representing Israel? It's, uh, to say the least, it's one of the most incredible feelings in the world to uh, proudly uh, have the opportunity to go to countries like uh, Bulgaria, Lithuania, Germany, and Italy, proudly wearing the royal and white and letting people know that uh, not only is Israel a country to be reckoned with, but uh, our baseball team as well uh, has become a international force and someone to be feared. Um, to be able to marry together uh, my two loves, which is uh, which are baseball and Israel, um, has just been one of the most incredible experiences of my life. And we look forward to uh, representing Israel uh, with the love and the professionalism uh, that Israel uh, deserves. And, uh, you know, we look forward to seeing you all and uh, root for us uh, this July in Tokyo and uh, Yala, Israel. Hey guys, John Moscott here, right-handed pitcher for Team Israel. I'll be a starter over there in Tokyo this summer. My relationship with Israel runs deep. I have cousins, my uncle lives in Israel. I've been there with my family many times and it's a special place in my heart for my family, of course, growing youth baseball there, my passion in my career and merging that with my heritage and my, my culture growing up here in the States is something that's been amazing and an amazing opportunity. And I'm very, very, very excited and proud to wear Israel across my chest in Tokyo this summer. Uh, we are currently raising money and funds to get over there as there's, they really didn't expect us to have a baseball team. So we, we've been out on our own trying to pursue those, those initiatives. And we appreciate any support that anybody can give, whether it's, you know, just a shout out on social media saying, Hey, we're supporting you guys, you know, all of that stuff helps us or, you know, a donation, anything that you guys are willing to do. So, um, you know, the American Zionist movement is something that I hold near and dear to my heart. And I do really appreciate everybody involved, you know, from the top Peter Kurz and, and everybody with the, the AZM. Um, we, we on Team Israel are very appreciative and we do not take it lightly. So thank you so much. And we'll see you guys in Tokyo this summer. Hi, my name is Dean Pellman. I'm a pitcher for Team Israel. Uh, I was actually living in Israel when we qualified. And when I found out about the team, I grew up in a house with two Israeli parents. All my family lives in Israel. We spent all our vacations going to Israel. We spoke Hebrew in the house. We listened to Hebrew music. We watched the Israeli news. My brother and I were both bar mitzvahed in Israel. Uh, Israel is very close to the heart. Uh, nothing really means more to me than putting Israel on that chest and getting to represent my country. That's really how I feel about it. Um, I got to experience some of the best memories of my life already through Team Israel. I, for one, was lucky enough to come in the 10th inning in Germany against Team Germany with both my parents there, who their parents, my grandparents, were survivors of the Holocaust, and I got to save in Germany. So that was one memory that I know my parents will hold dear to their heart forever, and I obviously will never forget. Uh, so thankful for Israel. I'm grateful for all the things that Team Israel has brought us and uh, definitely just very excited to continue this amazing journey. Thank you guys for everything you're doing and keep supporting. Go Team Israel. We are uh, pleased and honored to bring to you today Professor Erwin Kotler, the Canadian Special Envoy on Anti-Semitism and the founder and chair of the Raoul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights. Uh, Erwin Kotler doesn't just speak. 
he acts. In every respect, he works to battle anti-Semitism, he works to battle anti-Zionism, and he works against Holocaust distortion, Holocaust denial, and he works against the demonization of Israel, Zionism, and the Jewish people. Please welcome my dear friend, Erwin Kotler. Bruchim Abayim. Kavod gadol bishvili lishtatef ba'eruah mashmal tiazu. I'm speaking to you from Jerusalem, and I began in Hebrew because that is the indigenous language of the indigenous Jewish people. And before I actually go into my remarks, I want to express my appreciation to Richard Heidemann for his warm remarks, but in particular for his exemplary leadership of these past four years, not only with respect to the American Zionist movement, but indeed his leadership both domestically and internationally in all things good. In my remarks today, and as I mentioned, I began in Hebrew because that's the indigenous language of the uh, Jewish people, and Zionism is the national liberation movement of the Jewish people, the embodiment of that indigeneity, I'd like to make uh, four brief points. The first is that the Jewish people is a prototypical indigenous people, a people that still inhabits the same land, embraces the same religion, studies the same indigenous Torah, hearkens to the same indigenous prophets, speaks the same indigenous language Hebrew, and bears the same indigenous name Israel as we did 3,500 years ago. And that is why I say that the Jewish people is a prototypical indigenous people, and Zionism is a manifestation of that indigeneity and the embodiment of Jewish identity in its indigeneity. Which brings me to the second point, one not always appreciated, and that is that the Jewish people is not only a prototypical indigenous people, but it is a prototypical anti-colonialist people and movement, which has been struggling from time immemorial against all colonial attempts at dispossession and displacement, at dispersion and even destruction. We are reminded not only of the destruction of the two temples in Jerusalem, but the history of attempted dispossession, dispersal, displacement, and destruction. Whether we speak of the horrors of the Inquisition, the Crusades, or the whole on the road of persecutions and pogroms which preceded and paved the way for the Holocaust, which as Elie Wiesel reminded us so importantly and so significantly that the Holocaust was a war against the Jews in which not all victims were Jews, but all Jews were targeted victims, which makes the indictment of Israel as a colonial state and Zionism as a colonial movement, one of turning both facts, law, and history on its head. And I did not even reference the colonialist assaults on the nascent Jewish state in the wars of aggression beginning in 47 and 48 and continuing thereafter. Which brings me to the third point, that we are witnessing an old, new, global, escalating, sophisticated, virulent, and even lethal anti-Semitism, grounded in classical anti-Semitism, but distinguishable from it, which found its first institutional and international 
juridical expression in the Zionism is racism resolution, but has gone dramatically beyond that. A new anti-Semitism for which we almost need a new vocabulary to define it, but which can best be understood using a human rights lens in general and an equality rights lens and anti-discrimination approach in particular, which underpins also uh, the IRA working definition on anti-Semitism. Simply put, traditional or classical anti-Semitism is a discrimination against, denial of, assault upon, the rights of Jews to live as equal members in whatever society they inhabit. The new anti-Semitism is a discrimination against, denial of, assault upon, the rights of Israel and the Jewish people to live as an equal member of the family of nations, of the rights even to live, and the emergence of Israel as the collective targeted Jew among the nations, which finds expression today, and I hope you'll indulge me in a, using a series of one-liners with respect to this new anti-Semitism, but for reasons of time, and this is an informed audience, I'll do it that way, which finds expression today in what might be called genocidal anti-Semitism, the toxic convergence of the advocacy of the most horrific of crimes, namely genocide, embedded in the most toxic of hatreds, namely anti-Semitism, and finding expression, for example, in this standing incitement to hatred and genocide as represented in Khamenei's uh, Iran. And we need to be reminded also that the very incitement to genocide constitutes the crime, whether or not the atrocities follow. And so this standing incitement to hatred is itself an international crime, which we have to combat as those who care about the pursuit of international justice. And then we have what I would call demonological anti-Semitism. That is the portrayal of Israel and the Jewish people as the enemy of all that is good and the embodiment of all that is evil. And so it is then that Israel is portrayed not only as a colonialist, but an imperialist, ethnic cleansing, child killing, racist, apartheid, Nazi state. And I'm using only some of the daily indictments that find expression in this demonological anti-Semitism and where Zionism is inextricably bound up with this uh, international indictment, which leads me to the third manifestation of this new anti-Semitism, which I would call political anti-Semitism, the denial of Israel's right to exist, let alone also the denial of its legitimacy, the denial of the Jewish people's right to self-determination, if not also the denial of the Jews as a people, let alone even the indigeneity to which I was referencing. The whole, in effect, a denial uh, of Jewish peoplehood in any form or manifestation, and sometimes and crudely under the cover of anti-Zionism, which leads me to the fourth and final dimension of this new anti-Semitism, and perhaps uh, the most dangerous because it is the most sophisticated. And here I'm speaking about the laundering, the masking of anti-Semitism, of the delegitimization of Israel and the Jewish people under universal public values, under the protective cover of the United Nations, under the authority of international law, under the culture of human rights, and worse than I referenced it briefly, under the struggle against racism. Let's face it, the worst thing that you can do in the world today is to call somebody a racist or to call a people and a state racist. The very label supplies the indictment. No further proof is required. And if any further proof is required, then one continuously trots out the label of Israel as an apartheid state. Let there be no uh, mistake about it. Apartheid is defined in international law as a crime against humanity. If you say that Israel is an apartheid state, what you are saying is that Israel is a crime against humanity. If it is a crime against humanity, then it has no right to be. And if that is not enough, 
you refer to Israel as a Nazi state. So not only does it have no right to be, but there is an obligation to dismantle it. And hence the importance here of the IRA definition in calling out uh, this particular laundering of anti-Semitism under the cover of anti-racism, which is now extended to the referencing at times of the Jewish people as part of the white supremacist group, thereby, in effect, seeking to preclude the Jewish people of even having standing to enter the debate, of even having standing to join the conversation and to join the struggle against all forms of racism, including anti-Semitism. Let me also make it clear. None of this is intended to suggest that somehow Israel and the Jewish people are above the law or that Israel and the Jewish people deserve any particular uh, preference because of the Holocaust or the horrors of Jewish history. Not at all. What I'm saying is in equality rights terms, that nobody is seeking for Israel and the Jewish people to be above the law, but not to be systematically denied equality before the law. Not that uh, Israel should respect human rights, which we should, but that the rights of Israel deserve equal respect. Not that human rights standards should not be applied to Israel. They must be. But these standards must be applied to everyone else. And so I say the use of the equality rights lens and the human rights lens with respect to both understanding and combating of this new anti-Semitism. In conclusion, may I just say that I come to the support of Israel and the Jewish people, not because it is a Jewish cause. That would be not enough for me. I come to the support of Israel and the Jewish people because I believe profoundly with all its imperfections that it is a just cause. And if it is a just cause, it deserves the support of all those who care about the pursuit of justice. And similarly, with respect to Zionism, because Zionism as the expression of the national liberation movement of the Jewish people, of the Jewish people as an indigenous people equally deserves support for all those who engage in the pursuit of justice, both domestically and internationally. And so when I embrace the cause of Israel and the Jewish people and Zionism, I do so as someone who engages in it and with it as part of the larger struggle for the pursuit of international justice in our time. Thank you. Uh, today, we welcome Malcolm Honlein, um, who is such a visionary. Uh, such a leader, a person who has, at least in my view and in my lifetime, um, he is our Herzl. Um, he has been involved with the Zionist movement, and he's been involved with the principles of Zionism for uh, 50 years. Um, when it came to thinking about letting our people go, Malcolm was the leader who really put together and made happen the release of our people from the former Soviet Union. For uh, so many decades, Malcolm has served as the head, uh, as the executive vice chair of the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations, now the vice chair of the conference. And he is the single most respected voice in all of Jewish life on policy issues, but also he speaks not just from his head, he speaks from his heart, and he speaks in such a way that imparts to everyone from governments around the world to leaders of organizations across the spectrum he focuses us all on dealing with truth, on dealing with reality. And in the spirit of Herzl, and in the spirit of Herzl having provided leadership, having provided the vision that has led to the establishment of the modern state of Israel, and that has led to the reality of Israel, 
There is no one better to join us today than Malcolm Honeline. So let's begin a dialogue with Malcolm Honeline. And I know that each and every one of you participating today are going to feel as privileged as I do to have known him, to know him, to love and respect him, and to have the opportunity to share with him uh, the, 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 the passion we all have for Zionism, for Israel, and for the Jewish people. Because when it comes to Zionism, when it comes to Israel, and when it comes to the Jewish people, there is no one better with whom we could have a dialogue than Malcolm Honeman. So Malcolm, welcome. Wow, it was worth doing this just for that introduction. It's nice to hear your eulogy and be able to walk away. Uh, but I, I do want to, I want to thank you very much. I've had the privilege of working with you for many decades in your roles in B'nai B'rith and March of the Living and so many other contexts where I've seen the leadership you have provided and the wisdom and guidance you have given to our community. And I want to express appreciation to you for that and for this opportunity for us to be together um, at a time when our community is uh, hurting, especially after the events of, in, in Mehron recently. And of course, the Halimi case and so many other things, the rise of anti-Semitism, the challenges our community faces that uh, really uh, put a burden on many of us. So it's a chance for us to put everything into context and to look at where we are, where we came from, and as you said, where we're going. And Zionism, I believe, is at the core of a lot of that. Malcolm, thank you. A uh, little bird told me that you were there 50 years ago. And none of us like to talk about 50 years ago because it sort of dates us. But, you know, uh, for those um, who were survivors of the Shoah, the most important message I heard from so many of them as they continued to age and share their views and share their experiences, each and every one of them to a person always would use a phrase somewhat like, we are here. So Malcolm, you have been here for so long. You've provided leadership, as I said, you've provided vision, you have provided pathways for all of us. Take us back to your first experiences with the American Zionist movement and with our predecessor of the American Zionist Federation and other organizations that were the genesis of Zionism in the United States. Yes, well, first of all, I just wanna note that I was born at a very young age. So the span of time is a little deceptive. I'm still very young. And um, uh, actually I did start in my teens taking on leadership positions with the World Union of Jewish Students, which I organized in the United States and led in part to my first connection with the Zionist Federation. Although I had been long involved in Zionist youth movements, uh, both on campus and off campus, and truly believed that Zionism was essential to our identity. And regardless of which branch of Zionism you came from, it was part of our identity and essential to our future. Uh, just as I believe that political involvement and having control of our own fate, not live at the sufferance of others as we had for so many years. And I came to that conclusion when I was just even before my bar mitzvah and got involved politically in another way. So it, it uh, may seem uh, a little uh, odd that I, 60 years ago I was involved, but it was as a very young person. And my first involvement came actually at the founding convention of the American Zionist Federation, then your predecessor organization, when I was elected to be the national vice chairman for students and youth. And I had come as a representative of the young generation, hard as that is to believe today. And I, um, I really found there so many kindred souls, so many of the great names of our community uh, who were involved, Rabbi Israel Miller, I think was the chairman and her shafter, many others who I later associated with both in the Soviet Jewry movement and in the, even up to the conference presidents, both were past chairs, that uh, it, was, it was a very critical time in 1970. 
you know, it was right after the Six Day War. So there was this remarkable resurgence of Jewish identity, connection to Israel, of Zionism. That Zionism uh, and, and these events were the antidote to the aftermath, the decades after the Holocaust, when we came out as a, essentially a broken people with tremendous burdens, people still trying to come to terms. I don't know that we ever will with what had happened in that uh, very dark era. And Zionism helped to rehabilitate us both physically and mentally. It not only helped and, and led to the creation and recreation of the Jewish state, but also the recreation of the people, of the Jewish people. And at that convention, you could see this amazing spirit and dedication and commitment on people who wanted to change things. We were people who learned the lessons of never again. It's not just a hollow phrase that can be said at rallies and shouted or put on posters. It's really a pledge, I believe, that each generation has to take anew, and especially the younger generations, that we will learn the lessons of the past, the lessons of the Shoah, the lessons of the 30s, what we did and what we failed to do, our successes and our failures. Because we look back, and this is unique to Judaism, that we look back in order to look forward. We look back to learn the lessons, to spare future generations the trials and tribulations of the past, but also to learn from the successes and to be motivated and energized by them. And that was true at that period because Zionism was at the core of, of our excitement when we saw Jerusalem back in Jewish hands. We saw the excitement in, in Israel, the world, admiring the amazing achievements, both of the IDF and of the nascent Jewish state. Many of us remember when we used to have to, my parents would send the coffee and toilet paper to Israel and look at where we are today. So the, that era was unique in many respects. And it translated also into the creation of the Soviet Jewry movement, which was to me uh, an, an, a manifestation of never again, that we would not see an endangered Jewish community be abandoned to the indifference of the world, to, be, to suffer alone, that we would march, we would do everything necessary. And you remember well, in the Soviet Jewry movement, we did many response, legal and responsible but very effective things that people gave their whole lives. They devoted their lives to it. I know people lost their jobs because they were spending so much time on the Soviet Jewry movement. And it is, it was, I think, a chance for them to do tshuva, to, to show that they were different than some of the silence and indifference that was manifested 30 years, uh, 30 years earlier. So, I think that we can look back to that period of 50 years ago when young people had been energized and they, they became the gadflies of the community. I mean, they started in large part the Soviet Jewry movement. I remember coming to New York to visit Yaakov Birnbaum, Zichrona Levracha, when the student struggle and others, which really led to the creation of the larger movements. But it was also true in the Zionist community. When we created Woodges, you saw all of these extreme left and extreme right and rightists and centrists and everybody came together. But there was a dynamism and a commitment and wanting this linkage, each in their own direction, to Israel. And we have lost some of that today, which I'm sure we'll talk about. But it, the purpose of looking back and the purpose of examining that is not just to create the history, but to learn the lessons and see how we can capture that excitement and that energy and re-energize the Zionist movement, the Jewish community, how we reclaim Zionism, that we can't allow it to become a pejorative, that it become the subject of debate, whether anti-Zionism, which is anti-Semitism, denies the Jews the right to a state and the right of the state of Israel to exist, that is anti-Semitism. And the people who today want to water down the definition and not include that. So I think, the perspective of the past is really essential as we look to shape a, a, a better future in an era of cancel culture, which wants to wipe out history. For Jews, history is essential, not because we get lost in it, but because it's a guide for us for the future. We look back in order to look forward. And this is a time, and if I could say one more thing, the lesson of that period was that unity was the most essential component that we could overcome every challenge throughout our history. 
The one challenge we couldn't overcome is when Jews fought Jews, when Jews were disunited. When we're united, we could take on the Russia, that a prison that spanned two continents. When we're united, we were able to free Russian Jews and Ethiopian Jews and Syrian Jews, Iraqi Jews, Iranian Jews, Yemeni Jews. When we're divided, every challenge was too great. And it was true in the story of Hanukkah, the story of Purim, of every great miracle that happened to the Jewish people throughout our history, that we needed unity. And when we came together to found the Zionist uh, Federation and, and the Zionist movement as it is today, when we came together to organize for Soviet Jewry, to stand up for the state of Israel, to learn about how to become politically active and effective, that is a message that we need to learn today as well. Malcolm, thank you. When you look back um, over these 70 some years since the, the establishment of the state of Israel, um, some people say, well, we are in a post Zionist period because Zionism or the need for Zionism ended with the establishment of the state of Israel. I don't subscribe to that. I don't believe that you do. But people who are with us today, they may, shall we say, be confused about the issue. How do you define Zionism? How did you define it as a young student? And how would you define it today? Has it changed? And how has that change, if at all, interfaced with the growth and development and existence of the vibrant state of Israel? A very complex and important question, many questions, actually. I think it'd be a great book to, to write in examining uh, the points you raise, which are perceptive. Um, for me, Zionism, is support for the state of Israel, the recognition that it's the Jewish homeland. It's one in which we all have a stake, that it is uh, part of our future as much as it is part of our past. We pray for Zion every day, many times those who pray, and no matter how you pray, we all express it in, in perhaps in different interpretations, but we say the same words. We say the, the centrality of Zion, of Zion and, and uh, the return to Zion, and we say that we want to go back in for pleasant reasons and not because we're fleeing persecution. We need a place for that as well. But it's a positive expression. It's not anymore the Nebed Dechayid. It's not anymore a place just of rescue of refugees coming out of other places, but it has become a role model to the world. What we what today in high tech and in so many other areas in med tech and agriculture to see a country that is water self-sufficient, energy self-sufficient, that is a model to so many of the countries. When we travel in Africa, you travel in, in the Arab world, the Muslim world, Israel is held in such high regard. And even if they politically still are, are reluctant to give expression to it. But I think the Abraham Accords were, were a major turning point in the public recognition of it. And you see that Lagba Omer events in, in Arab countries or Holocaust Memorial Days being marked in, in Muslim countries and in Morocco and the UAE and Bahrain and elsewhere and Azerbaijan. I mean, these are remarkable changes that have taken place and that Israel is seen as a critical component. It's not, it's not the, the stepchild of the rich uncles in America who will support them. But they, in many respects, are supporting us. No one today can imagine what life would be like without Israel. And to me, Zionism means the fulfillment of all of the dreams that of the generations of being able to come together and govern ourselves, even if we're very difficult to govern people, and to be able to have a true Jewish fulfillment, to live by a Jewish calendar, to live in a true Jewish environment, regardless of your le level of uh, personal observance, but to have that sense, and, and you know what, where I saw it? After the tragedy in Mayrome, the lines in Tel Aviv of people lining up to give blood for the Haredim, with whom they all have clashes, and we see all of the media reports about the divisions, but that isn't what, what when it came to the bottom line. Hundreds of people waiting in line to give blood. That is, to me, the, a true expression of Am Yisrael in Eretz Yisrael, with Torah Yisrael, with the, our Torah, our heritage in the land of our forefathers and, uh, and for many, our future, when more than half of the Jewish people uh, live there. 
and a recognition that what we have in common far outweighs our differences. And it doesn't mean you can't have differences over policies that Israel pursues. But when we see people trying to eliminate anti-Zionism from the definition of anti-Semitism, it is a mistaken interpretation of history and of reality and very dangerous. And especially when it comes within the community, because if you can't have a common definition, if you can't identify it, you can't fight it. And we now have the IRA definition, which includes examples of anti-Semitism, not determined by the Jewish community, but by others. And I think to me, this coming together, this common expression of looking to Zion for inspiration, maybe for Aliyah, maybe encouraging people in a time when we see the rise of anti-Semitism and, and more hostile atmosphere in many continents around the world, even in our own country. And if I can say, I think that during this past year, many people came to this realization because of COVID, which is the perfect storm, uh, you know, in, uh, at a time of increasing polar, uh, polarization and politicization, that people have been taken away from visiting Israel and connecting to Israel for more than a year. And how many of them have said to me, they're dying to go to Israel. They're just waiting for Israel to open up. They realize because it wasn't available, how much it means to them that we often take for granted Israel, that it'll be there and we can visit any time and we go and we come and we look with pride at, at what we've done when in fact it's what they have done. And now I think a lot of people have come to that realization of how central Israel is, that Zion is to all of our lives. Many who would have rejected the notion for a variety of cultural and other reasons, I think today look at it differently. So we're entering a time of incredible challenges, international and domestic, at a time when we are facing an onslaught of renewed Jew hatred. And not, I don't call it anti-Semitism when I remember because it's, it's an, an antiseptic term. And it reminds us of the importance of Israel and what would life be like today if we didn't have a Jewish state, a Jewish army. The difference from the 30s is not that the world has changed, it's not a more caring place. There isn't less hatred. We see it manifest in so many ways. The difference is that we have a Jewish state and a Jewish army, a Jewish air force, and Jewish communities that are in danger could be saved. If it weren't for that, you wouldn't have saved Ethiopian Jews and all of the other communities that we had been privileged in our lifetime to see come home. Malcolm, you use the expression in the land of our forefathers. Do you think that uh, the modern Jewish community, not only young people, but the, the older generations, understand the, the richness, the history, the ancestral nature of Israel as the homeland of the ancient Jewish people? Uh, unfortunately, probably not. It is interesting, though, that when they wanted to identify this new relationship of Israel with the Arab countries, they called it the Abrahamic Accords because of the common ancestry, but because it, is, it was the starting point in history for our communities. And you see these amazing historic discoveries, which I regret very much. Our educational system and our organizations hardly emphasize on one of my national broadcasts, radio broadcasts every week. One of the segments I devote just to talking about the incredible discoveries, every one of which underscores our historic ties at a time when people are denying the right of Israel to exist, denying Israel's legitimacy or the our history there, trying to rewrite it. Every one of the thousands, tens of thousands of discoveries underscore that connection. And so we looked at a history which has significance for our future, just as we look to the future rooted in our past. And today we, we have ignored it. We have a, a generation that is ignorant, unfortunately. You see the, every study shows that they don't know Jewish history, that general populations don't know about Auschwitz and don't know about the Holocaust, let alone much more ancient ties and, and history. But unfortunately, I have to say, that it's true of a large part of our Jewish youth. They don't know. And we have ignored them for too long. We have not offered the kind of creative approaches 
It's something I try to wrestle with for many years in different ways, going to the most creative people in the world and trying to identify how we reach and inspire our youth to understand what a tremendous privilege it is to be a Jew. It's not just to lay on them the tsaras. We have to talk about the Holocaust. We have to give them the historical perspective, but we also have to teach them the victory, the joy, the celebration. And Zionism is a way of doing that, is of talking about this, the, not only the survival, but the triumph of the Jewish people, despite all of the historic challenges and taking a look at every one of our enemies who are far more powerful, have all been lost to history. They're all gone, but the Jewish people remain. And now we are in our Jewish state, 9 million Jews, 9 million people coming together, living a Jewish life. And what we have to do is to teach our kids, birthright can be very important, but it also has to inspire. It's not just for them to come and have a tour and then go home. And you can't ignore them the first 18 years of their lives and expect that birthright is gonna make them Jews for, for the rest of their lives. It helps, it's important in the exposure to Israel, I believe, is critical for all of us, but we need inspiration. Young people are looking for that. They, they wanna be in, inspired and excited. They wanna learn and we have to make it palatable ways to do it. And that starts with the youngest of, in our community. You know, the Catholic church says, give me a kid till he's six years old. You can have him the rest of their lives. We do so little to educate our youth and they see the reports on television. They see the attacks on the Jewish people and on the state of Israel. But nobody tells an 8, 10, 11-year-old, let me sit down and explain to you what you're seeing. So we have to do much more. And now we have a, a qualitative change and a quantitative change with the internet that what took Hitler months to spread a big lie. Today, it's done in nanoseconds. But it can be a vehicle for good if we use it creatively and use it to reach out to our people. Look how many devoted Jews, let alone uh, nominal Jews, are involved in this industry, that we have to tap into them. And we are trying to do it. And I met just in recent weeks with some of the top names, and they're very excited about the prospect of, of doing it because they see it in their own kids that they, they need to, to counter the alienation and the um, doubts and the questions that they're getting on campus, even in high schools, we see it increasingly. And it's younger and younger that we're losing some of our, our best and brightest because we're not filling them and fulfilling and answering the questions. And we're not providing the kind of uh, response to this challenging period. And, I, and I'm going beyond anti-Semitism at, at, uh, at this point. And to understand that what the anti-Semites say about Zionism, they don't mean them, they mean us that you can't make this distinction, that we get young people to understand what the collectivity of the Jewish people and that the whole is far greater than the sum of the parts, that we cannot make this separation and draw the inspiration. You know, we look at the, at the anti-Semitism around the world today, the rise in Europe, double digit increases, even in New York City, everywhere. But one place, it's different. In one sector of the world, and that's in the Muslim world, where we see for the first time decrease in anti-Semitism, where governments are speaking out against it. So we ought to be learning from them. And many of them say to me, we don't understand. Why don't your kids appreciate what Israel means, what Zionism really has to teach the world? And I think that is a challenge for all of us now. And we need to work collectively. We have to put aside the differences. We recognize them. It doesn't mean sacrificing principle. It means recognizing the commonality of the challenges, that it affects all of our children. It's everybody's security that will be impacted by the decisions that we make. We say the same Shema, so our faith, we have one faith and one faith, and recognizing that, and recognizing what we have in common and building on that, just as we respect whatever differences may exist in our community. To those of us who work day to day with this battle against the demonization of Israel and the Jewish people. What answer do you believe we should be giving in the court of public opinion? What answer do you believe we should be giving to our young people as it relates to those who deny Israel's ancestral rights, to those who deny and distort the Holocaust, and to those who deny the very existence or the right to existence 
of the modern state of Israel? I think, first of all, we have to take our kids seriously. And we have to offer a smorgasbord approach because there isn't one answer for everybody, but we have to find ways that attract each element in our community. And it doesn't matter where they are on the spectrum, religiously, politically, or in any other way, ideologically. It means that we have to find ways to creatively reach them and find the people who can reach them. You know, we did an extremely extensive study a few years ago of the Jewish and non-Jewish communities the biggest study ever done in depth of thousands of people to try to understand exactly this alienation that you talk about. And what we found out is they didn't turn hostile to Israel as much as they became indifferent. For us, indifference is a loss. You know, in politics, if somebody doesn't vote, so they dismiss them, they become irrelevant. That's not true when it comes to support for Israel or the relationship with Israel. And at a time when we're seeing this war on Jewish history, on the Jewish people, on the Jewish faith, on the Jewish state, on the Jewish past, and on the Jewish future, it's a time when we have to come together and unite all of our resources and use them in a collective way that gives importance to young people to let them know we hear their voices, even if sometimes we're uncomfortable with them. I remember when the students rebelled at the uh, uh, General Assembly of the Jewish uh, of the Federations years ago in, in Boston or at the uh, Jewish Agency, the World Zionist Congress in Arad, and I played a role in that. But it was because we wanted to change things for the good. But I learned early on when I led the first demonstration for more money for Jewish education in my native Philadelphia, that if you want to make a difference, you have to be on the inside, that you have to be a player within the structure and utilize those who are outside and try to bring them in. And I know AZM is a vehicle with a broad spectrum. The World Jewish Con Zionist Congress, the uh, Jewish Agency are all vehicles for bringing broad spectrums of the community together. And we have to reach out to those who feel no association, who haven't found a channel and create it for them and to, to attract them. When we did the study, we identified that getting people like football stars, movie stars that young people relate to and taking them to Israel so that when they came back and they say, this is no apartheid state, it has a lot more meaning. And it's remarkable. I never seen a failure on the part of one of these trips when these very important people, uh, A-line, A-level stars that everybody predicted we would never get. And the, and uh, their impact on their return when they would come and speak to audiences or give interviews and, and talk about what, what they're seeing. I just want to remind everyone that a lot of what we are seeing today, the poison in the system, can be traced to Zionism is racism resolution in 1975. That although it was repealed, its damage was not undone. That coming now to the fourth anniversary of the Durban conference, and I know you were involved at the time, and Melissa, I, People don't realize that the attack on Zionism, it was a vehicle to attack the Jewish people when you couldn't say, I hate Jews, but you could say, I hate Zionists. And now if anybody wants to understand how central that is to all of us, see how Zionism racism became pervasive in the system, how that cancer spread and now became an expression today. We see it in, in racist charges and all sorts of uh, horrific expressions against Israel and, and the Jewish people. Uh, so I think we have to learn how to, to use the technological advances of Israel to attract some young people, to bring more of them to, and I'm fortunate to be involved in a program that's bringing leading scientists back to Israel. And you see the amazing success rate that people who left Israel today are coming back because Israel's at the forefront of so much, but more than that, the importance of Israel and I think re-educating our teachers or educating our teachers so they can teach about Israel and creating very exciting curricula to, to uh, enable our, our young people have to be convinced before they can convince others. They have to be secure in what they believe. They can't be just told, this is what you have to believe. It's not going to work anymore. We have to show them logically. We have to show them historically. We have to give them the facts, the figures, and understand what um, what positions they can advocate with confidence, because that's the only way that they will be convinced themselves and be able to convince others and their peers. So I think we have to reassess a lot of what we are doing. 
And I believe we should be doing a zero sum assessment of our community to see how we reallocate the resources because there aren't unlimited resources and never will be, and how we can be more effective in making the case for Israel, attracting our young people in the various ways that we can, and building a secure future for the, in general, between America and Israel and Israel standing in the world. Before we let you go today, I'd like to press you on three issues that you touched upon. First, more about the young people. You talked about your own experiences way back as a student, how it motivated you. You talked about the, what I'll use the word crisis, the challenges young people are facing on their college campuses today. And you referenced uh, anti-Semitism uh, that I will link to the college campus issue. Please tell all of us what you think is the path we should be taking with our young people to help them deal with these challenges today on their campuses, in their communities, in their own families, and as it relates to building their own leadership future as a contributor to the American Jewish and world Jewish community. So again, a subject for another symposium uh, with between us uh, to talk about the various approaches and, and what can work. One of the reasons why I press unity and I headed umbrella organizations, though it wasn't the easiest thing to do, as you know, and all of those I'm sure who listen to this know are involved in the community because I really believe in Claudia Israel. I really believe that the hyphens in the Jewish people are counterproductive, that we have to look at what we have in common and build on that. And in, you create an atmosphere of respect for dealing with it. When we tell young people, when they see different leaders say, oh, that segment, they're never wrong. When they attack another segment of the community and they say, well, maybe they're all wrong. Maybe those who are arguing against them are right when they try to undermine Zionism or try to dilute the meanings of so many of the critical things that we are trying to advocate these days and not willing to stand up and declare proudly and, and convincingly the positions that we advocate. And it doesn't mean demeaning and, and eliminating others. It means educating and bringing them along and finding the common ground to be able to advocate but we can't water down our positions in order to attract people. What they will respect in the long run is consistency. They will respect it if you have a legitimate case to make. And if they see our community is divided, we undermine that ability to support, to, to, to gain their support. And also we undermine the use of our resources, maximizing the available resources and coherence of our community to address these very serious challenges, anti-Semitism today is a serious challenge globally. We see the loss of the political center. We see the partisanship. We see the politicization. We see the divisions. We see the, the rise of extremists, extreme left, extreme right. And each side says, oh, it's the other side. No, it's both sides. And we need a collective approach to protect our students. So every kid on campus should know that if he stands up and or she speaks for Israel, that we will be there for them that there will be legal backing for them, that there will be communal backing for them, that they will not stand alone, that they feel that they are isolated. And they also have to have a sense that they are, their message resonates, that their message is true, that they can say it convincingly. That's what I meant before, that if a young person meets these uh, leftist professor on a campus who challenges I mean, they're afraid to speak up and they tell us so because they don't feel confident that they have the information. So we need to use our schools and our educational challenge, channels to make sure that everyone who visits Israel doesn't just get to see the beauty of the country, but understands the history, the challenges, the reality. Look, Israel's not Disneyland. It's not perfect. Sometimes it's never, never land, but it's not perfect. And we can say that no country is perfect. But to compare it to any other country, to look at the challenges that Israel faces, what it has done for the world, and we can show them in environmental, whatever is attractive to those people, to young people today, we should find those things and be able to advocate and to be able to educate them and involve them in programs that uh, ad address those uh, uh, kind of issues. And to, to address, I think, the vision that Herzl had, you know, it isn't a dream. 
you can you you can accomplish anything you really set your mind to. Our community can accomplish so much more if we didn't spend so much of our efforts in internal strife and in in divisiveness. And again, I'm not asking everybody to become uh, you know Levittown that everybody looks the same and dresses the same and is the same. I want them to have the diversity. That quilt of the Jewish community is part of our strength, but not if we water down our issues that, as I said, this what very upsets me is when we see the efforts to, to when the world is coming together behind the IRA definition and with including its examples at 30 countries adopted, hundreds of universities and institutions, and yet we try then to undermine it. People can use it the way they want, but there's no point in trying to undermine uh, what is core to our effort in countering this war against the, the Jewish people. We've got to make a commitment that we will not be silent, that each of us has to make a commitment that we will be involved, that we will strengthen our institutions, the AZM, the agency, the chesed work that we saw during COVID be continued and continued in many ways, supporting our charitable institutions, but also our political advocacy. We've lost time with this. We see the extremes gaining, even in America, we have to counter it through education, through manifestations of, of uh, ki many kinds, not confrontations, but in ways that are constructive and positive. We have truth. That's our strongest weapon. And sometimes the truth can be a little bit disturbing, but that's not bad. We have that is our strongest weapon. It's Israel's strongest weapon. It's Zionism's strongest weapon. And to build on thousands of years of tradition, on the centrality of Zion and Zionism to us, should be something that we all see as a positive and as an aspiration that every organization, regardless of its mandate, should incorporate as central to its, its message. It's more important today than I think it has been in decades. And the lessons of 50 years ago, that unity is the key to our survival, that the internecine warfares and differences undermine that, our pledge to future generations, to their security. And we, I think all collectively should be sitting down together and working out how we set this agenda against the challenges, because we proved that when we want to, and when we will it, we can accomplish it. Thank you, Malcolm. It leads, what you said leads right to the last issue I wanted to ask you about. And you've spoken about the need for unity in so many eloquent and impactful ways here today. We have marched together on the March of the Living, Phyllis and you and us and so many others. We have been in the gas chambers. We have seen the crematoria. We have seen the hair and the shoes and the cooking utensils. There are some who continue to, dis to deny, to distort, and to choose to push away as if it didn't happen and therefore to forget the Holocaust. You and I am, have heard Rabbi Lau say many times, if we can die together, we can learn to live together. As we close here today, Malcolm, You've shared so many insights. Please share with us your view as we look back over these years, as we look back at the Shoah, as we look back at all that we've experienced. What is a single lesson from the Shoah, from the Holocaust, that you would like to impart to the young people who are listening today or will view this in the future and to the leaders across the spectrum of American Jewish and Zionist life on the issue of the lessons we must learn, remember and share coming from the Shoah. In an era of the cancel culture where we try to rewrite history or destroy history, if you ignore history, it's the peril of future generations, that the lessons of history are not about us, 
It's about our children and our grandchildren. Because those who lose, lose that perspective, who are unable to learn from the past, which gives us a context in which to understand. And, you know, many people ask, why were the Jews different? And I think it is our sense of history, which gives us a context to see through the chaos and perceive the dangers that others don't see. I can tell you many times with American leaders and others, and I would raise an issue and they would say, well, I don't see that. I don't see that. It's not because we know more than they do. It's because our context of Zechira, remembrance, is so central to all of Jewish life. The great commandments are given in the contents of Zachor, remember. Remember the Sabbath, remember the Exodus. Because to us, remembrance is a guide. It's an ability to us to arm us, to give us a context in which to meet the challenges of the future by looking at the past, not to get lost in history as the fundamentalists do, but to enable us to be rooted in a way that we, when you have strong roots, you can flourish. You know, they, they liken Jews to the willow tree. Why a willow tree? Because you can cut off all the branches. As long as one is alive, it can re-flourish again. And we have suffered many losses, six million just uh, 80 years ago, a third of our people. And now we see a flourishing Jewish state. We see Jewish communities coming back. We have great challenges in terms of continuity, assimilation, et cetera, all issues that we can confront. If, if we confront them as a, as a united community, and at a time when you see all of those who try to demean those connections and who try to under, undermine them uh, in the general culture of the world, the world culture, et cetera, and the, the uh, rewriting of the history and trying to impose uh, certain standards or, or definitions, which I think in the long term are going to be uh, very dangerous for, for all of us. So the lesson I think that from the Shoah is one, listen to dictators. They tell the truth. Leaders of democracies lie. Hitler told us in Mein Kampf a decade before the Holocaust, the, the, in the 1924, what he was going to do, but nobody took him seriously. Stalin told everybody what he was going to do. Nobody took him seriously. And we have to look back even to the pharaohs who told us what he was going to do. And he doesn't say the Jews did anything wrong. He said, we have to deal shrewdly with them because maybe they will become, maybe they will do. He had no charges against them. That's the definition of anti-Semitism today. It's baseless. It's not, Jews are not perfect. And I'm not advocating saying that, uh, you know, everybody, every charge against Jews is necessarily anti-Semitic. But the, the, most of them are baseless. And when they do it as a collective, if they have something against an individual, that's something that can be dealt with. So the lesson there was, number one, that take the threats seriously. Number two, try to anticipate, but based on history to learn a lesson and know what the signals are. What is it that we should be looking for? And I will tell you in America, I believe we should be looking at what happens in England and in Europe generally, but England in particular. When I saw what BDS did there, I warned people years before it started and said it would be that way, starting amongst the intellectuals and working its way down, not like in France where it works from bottom up. And it was, and we have to look at Europe today the loss of the political center, the division, divisiveness, the rise of extremist groups, all of the threats that they exist, that exist, and especially the anti-Semitism uh, uh, and the uh, violence that's accompanying it. As, and we have to take prophylactic measures then to try and prevent it. But you have to understand it, you have to see the signs, and you have to be willing to act on those signs. So number one, it is to be aware, to, to take seriously the threats, so when a, a Khamenei said, I'm going to destroy the Jewish state, take it seriously. He means what he says, and he's seeking the means to do it. Then I think the lesson of unity, that too often they meant, they said, it's those Jews, the Jews from this part, the Jews from that part, but they don't mean us. We learned the lesson that it means all of us. When one part of the Jewish people is in danger, all of us are in danger. It's like one body, if part of body is sick, the whole body is affected. So we have to again, see ourselves as a unified people with differences that we address with respect, that we try to understand each other, that we recognize our common tradition, our heritage, our Torah, which guides us and provides inspiration and direction for us, that we inspire our youth with positive messages, positive experiences, and show them the unity that whatever different interpretations we have, we recognize the common truths 
that will keep them as part of the community, that they will grow Jewish families, that they will spread it to their future generations. You know, human beings are the only species that relates to a third generation, I was told. And many animals relate to their children, but not to grandchildren. We look to the future. We judge our success by what our grandchildren will look like. Did we take the steps today to make sure that they would have a more secure world? Did we help educate them? But did we also create the circumstances in society that would assure that they survive? And that to me is the Jewish approach to life, that we look back, we look at our great-great-grandparents from the thousands of years ago, but we also look to our great-great-grandchildren because what we do today determines their future and their security. Malcolm, we appreciate you. We salute you. We thank you. And we love you. It's mutual. And I thank you. And I thank AZM for all the wonderful work. And again, I think we have to use it as a, as a core engine for creativity, for creative approaches, for um, relating to the entire Jewish people and outside of the Jewish community, to building new coalitions, uh, making people secure in the advocacy on behalf of Israel and Zionism. Education is the key to so much of it. And with leadership like you and the others in AZM, devoted people here and around the world, we can accomplish it. Thank you. And thanks to all of you today for joining us as we've had a dialogue with Malcolm Honline and focused it on the vision, the leadership, and the spirit of uh, Theodore Herzl. Because Malcolm, you indeed are our modern day Theodore Herzl. I'm gonna grow a beard now. We want to thank uh, each of you for having joined us uh, today in this special American Zionist Movement, a National Zionism Conference. We thank each of our presenters. Uh, we thank our uh, professional uh, staff, uh, Herbert Block and Alicia Post. We thank uh, the board chair, um, Dr. Francine Stein, and all of the officers, all of the uh, members of the board of directors, uh, and all of those who serve on the AZM Leadership Cabinet for your contribution to moving Zionism forward and uh, for your focus on working together across the spectrum of Jewish Zionist life in the United States, through all of our synagogues, through all of our communities, all of us working together on behalf of the future of Israel, Zionism, and the Jewish people. Please join us and stand for Hatikva, the national anthem of the State of Israel and the national anthem of the Jewish people.